All righty here. I see our participant count climbing uh, just for the purposes of the, the folks in our audience tonight, both virtually and in person. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, how the meeting will go tonight, this is gonna follow the same format as a standard board meeting does. Uh, the superintendent will be presenting some information for the board to review and discuss. Uh, after we get through with item two on our agenda, that superintendent's report, we'll move on to item three, which is the citizen's request to address the board. Uh, we'll start with the folks in the room. If they have comments, we'll go up to three minutes per comment. Um, and then we'll go through the orders, uh, go through the folks that are virtual who would like to provide comment to the administration of the board. Um, in doing so, uh, as a reminder, the board will not be answering questions and the administration will not be answering questions. This really is a time for you to provide statements to us. If there's follow-up necessary, we'll be happy to follow up after meeting. Uh, item four on our agenda then, the board will uh, be entertaining a motion uh, to alter our current um, COVID protocols, which includes the mask mandate, but it is more wide reaching than, than just a mask mandate. Um, should that fail, uh, just so our uh, public knows, uh, the board will actually be staying with status quo where we are today, which is strongly recommended with the other COVID protocols. Um, but we may go through a motion, we may go through amending that motion, there may be a number of actions that the board takes as an official action. Uh, and then we'll close out with board comments at the end of the meeting. So uh, I do appreciate everyone kind of just hanging tight until we get to that citizen's request, if that's the time that you'd like to uh, speak with the board, but we will be happy to hear every single person tonight that would like an opportunity to uh, speak with the board for three minutes. With that, Dr. Schwarz, we will turn it over to you for item two, our superintendent's report. Great, thank you, Mr. Lang. Um, welcome everyone to our special board of education meeting. Uh, this meeting is really a one topic uh, meeting, uh, and that is to really uh, discuss our, or revisit our fall protocols uh, regarding COVID mitigation. And uh, a few weeks ago, the board had passed a motion um, in which particularly pertaining to masks was a uh, strongly recommended or highly recommended uh, motion uh, in moving forward as the board was considering uh, all of the recommendations from medical agencies, uh, that being the CDC, the MDHHS, uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics, uh, and also uh, you know, other entities uh, that, again, much the same, gave a, a recommendation for schools to follow. Uh, we were also at that time in absence of any uh, recommendations or frankly any advice or guidance from the Oakland County Health Department, uh, which is our local uh, agency uh, to help us in governing decisions. Uh, we've also noted that um, we would, as a, as a board, as a leadership team, come back together uh, when we felt that perhaps the conversation was to be had to revisit based on um, changes in the environment you know, changes in transmission rates, uh, changes in information that we were garnering uh, and, um, you know, looking forward into, into the school year. And, and we, uh, we have had uh, some changes uh, in transmission rates. Uh, we've all heard about the Delta variant. Uh, we've all heard about uh, the Delta variant and its impacts particularly in states south of us, uh, where it is particularly bad. Uh, and we are aware that that's spreading very quickly. We are aware that people continue to travel. Uh, and uh, when the information that we received uh, late last week in regards to uh, COVID projections uh, are, not, are not good. Um, you know, we can stick our heads in the sand and pretend COVID's not going to happen or that variant's not going to happen here or those rates aren't going to happen here. Uh, but the data, the projections that the health authorities are releasing to us say otherwise. Uh, and that's really the purpose uh, of this meeting is to uh, take a look at some of that information uh, and weigh whether or not at this point in time we uh, change our, our stance, particularly with, uh, with our masks uh, in moving forward. You know, and at the end of the day, um, you know, this isn't about favoring choice or, or not favoring choice or, 
because we we understand there's a huge division uh, in, and we've heard loud and clear every every opinion imaginable uh, on people's stance on masks. And that's fine. Uh, you know, uh, I respect personal choice. Uh, and I think this board has made statements to that effect as well, that certainly we re respect personal choice. But that's really not the question that is on the table today. Uh, what's on the table today is what what do we do as a community, as a community to come together so that we do not have to, one, have students miss 10 to 14 days of school and quarantines? How do we come together as a community so that we are not going back to remote education? Because I guarantee you, everybody on this call, uh, on this screen, in this meeting and otherwise, do not wanna go back to remote learning. So in what ways do we work as a community to prevent that? Because that's the end game. The end game for us as educators, the end game for me as a superintendent is preserving educational opportunity. I'm not a health official. No one around this board table is a health official. So we're not here to debate pro-mask, anti-mask, our job here at this table is how do we preserve educational opportunity and what steps can we take to help preserve that educational opportunity and keep kids in school, keep kids in seat in their classroom, having a more normalized educational experience than what they've had in the last 18 months. That's the question on the table today. So uh, this is not for us to debate choice, not choice. It's about how do we preserve and keep kids in school. So um, uh, I'll start this presentation uh, with a slide from uh, where we currently are at with the COVID um, rates in our county. Uh, so uh, Julie, if you can put up the slide from the health department on the weekly COVID report. <clears throat> Yep, there we go, thank you. All right, so each week we receive data from the Oakland County Health Department in terms of transmission rates uh, locally. Uh, and for the period of August 4th to August 17th, which you see here, uh, you can see that we have an increasing number of cases uh, in the county um, um, that has continued to increase from uh, actually a, quite a bit in the last three weeks uh, from where we were at uh, below 3% to now we're up near 7% in a matter of, uh, of just a few weeks. Uh, and, you know, that becomes alarming for us in terms of, you know, looking forward. Um, when you look at these statistics, we really look at the percent positivity rate, uh, which you see is at 6.6%. Uh, and again, that's continuing to rise. When we were at 6.6% back in the spring, we were all in masks, right? We were taking those precautions. And... Um, you know, we're, we're back to seeing those rates again. And, we're, and uh, there is no forecast uh, of these rates coming down anytime soon. In fact, the projections, which I'll show you in a few minutes, show that these rates are only going to increase uh, through the fall, and particularly as the weather gets colder uh, and people are coming back from traveling to Southern states where it's much worse and so on and so forth. So again, how do we look at the question on the table from a protection perspective? Uh, and from a preventative perspective. Uh, folks will say, well, you ran summer school optional. Yes, we did. And those were uh, the lowest rates. Uh, those few weeks we had of summer school were the lowest rates of the pandemic. Uh, we were well below uh, a 3% threshold, below a 2% threshold at the end of June, beginning of July. Um, so at that point, certainly, you know, going optional uh, was... Uh, appropriate uh, for, for those rates. 
Uh, we did not have any quarantines, luckily, uh, with those. Uh, but that's rapidly changing. Um, this week alone, as I sit here today, we have 12 quarantines in the school district of children who are not able to attend school this week because they are currently quarantining, uh, because they've traveled and, and came back with, with uh, uh, a COVID, uh, or they've gotten it elsewhere outside of school. But, uh, you know, we're starting the school year on day one with already 12 quarantines. Uh, that number is only going to go up uh, unless you know, we take further precautions. Uh, and you start to think about the amount of time out of school now that students have to spend because they're quarantining. That's what we want to avoid. So, um, uh, so luckily, again, with summer school, we were able, luckily, not to have any quarantines. But again, that environment is changing and changing rapidly. Uh, Julie, you can scroll down on this. Uh, as you see the second part of this uh, page, just go to the second page, uh, Julie, there. So every age group is seeing rises in COVID uh, right now. Um, we're seeing a spike uh, in the five to nine-year-old ranges. Um, these are higher numbers than we've seen previously. Uh, and, you know, and we're hearing cases of uh, this affecting children, this variant affecting children more so than um, the strain that we had experienced prior. Um, you're hearing about ICUs being filled in other states uh, with children, with, you know, so there is a concern uh, with kids that's heightened more so than the previous strain uh, that we've dealt with. So uh, luckily, um, we haven't seen it here uh, locally yet. And I underscore the word yet. So, um, The uh, I'd like to share with you a uh, an, a PowerPoint that was distributed through our health department. This comes from MDHHS through the Oakland County uh, Health Departments. Uh, this is a very similar uh, uh, PowerPoint that has been used in uh, in other districts around us that have reconsidered their stance. Uh, Troy, uh, Bloomfield Hills, Birmingham, uh, most recently. I have changed their stance. Uh, there are several board meetings scheduled this week, much like ours, to also have this same conversation. Um, so uh, this is a, a set of data that, again, put out by our health agencies that give us, uh, you know, uh, again, a projection model, a simulation model of when we con consider masks uh, or consider not mandating masks, what the impacts could potentially be. So um, go ahead, Julie, you can flip to the screen. So again, this is a model uh, that is, uh, you know, from uh, one of the modeling teams that have been funded by the CDC and the Council for States, territorial epidemiologists, uh, so this is, again, coming from the medical community, uh, and it's really looking at forecasting this spread, particularly of the Delta variant, um, as, it moves, as it moves through. Um, and again, I underscore, particularly as, as the weather becomes colder, uh, kids become more confined indoors. Um, so go ahead, Julie, next slide. So again, this uh, model is to uh, estimate the proportion of susceptible students uh, that could be infected throughout a school semester. So in looking at uh, a 90 to 100 day plus type of a timeline, uh, what the, the uh, possible impact can be uh, relative to masking and testing policies. So again, Next slide is imagining a school. So you imagine a school where you have a population of 500 students, okay? Imagine that school population where 500 students, where you have two to three uh, that already begin uh, with an infection at the start of the semester. Keep in mind right now we have 12. Uh, that student population, if you consider 500 kids, two to three students begin in, uh, that infected at the start of the semester, 
Uh, but we realize that we know we have some students that already have had COVID previously, so they have built up uh, and a sense of immunity to that. Um, if you look at the chart here at the bottom, so they uh, essentially project a, uh, a protection percentage rate, uh, which you see there, which they're saying that based on their formulas, that if, uh, if you think 30% of students have had COVID at some point in the last 18 months, that, you know, it gives you a if you that number of students in that pool gives you about a 30 percent protection rate uh, if that population of students con, uh, considering that they are eligible uh, would be, give you another 20 percent of protection rate which gives you an incoming protection rate of about 50 percent uh, in that particular environment if you scroll down julie uh, from a high school setting you have a protection rate of about 50% based on their models uh, because of one, the number of students who have already had COVID and have built that immunity and another percentage within that that have had the vaccine uh, and that uh, have been vaccinated, which gives you about a 50% total uh, protection rate, 50% susceptibility rate. Middle school, your susceptibility rate's a little greater uh, as uh, the um, middle school grades typically are six through eight. Most sixth graders, uh, if they're falling under that age of 12, they're not vaccinated. Uh, so that creates a little discrepancy, which you know really builds in that 60-40, which is that differential from high school. Elementary, you have no students vaccinated, uh, at least not yet, uh, which is the greatest uh, concern and also, you know, you, we have had some students that have had COVID uh, that come and building in that, that uh, immun or, uh, immunity rate of about 30%. So you see the susceptibility rates of, of garnering COVID in these environments with elementary being the most at risk, followed by the middle school, followed by the high school with vaccinations being largely uh, a variable to that. Next, Julie. So, uh, you know, again, if you consider those variables and then every week you're adding a new student that is infected outside the school that comes into the school, uh, it, it's gonna grow your, your risk. Go ahead, Julie. Now with testing, this is saying that with random testing, which we are not, I'm not advising that we get into the random testing of students. Uh, that's not something that I think many school districts are going down the road of in terms of, you know, the, the, we're leaving that to parents to um, take upon themselves if they wish to have their children tested uh, or, or tested on a regular basis, that's their prerogative. But we as a school district are not entertaining that as part of uh, what we're discussing today. But this, is, uh, this slide is really pertaining to, you get a further decrease of risk if there is random student testing that, that is occurring. Go ahead, Julie. Uh, and so again, this just gets into that uh, in terms of the impact of testing uh, with students, uh, which we're not gonna really jump into. Uh, it's really the, the, the mask portion of this. Uh, so go ahead, Julie, scroll down. So this chart is important to, to note. So we noticed that again, elementary uh, has uh, the most riskiest population followed by middle, followed by high school uh, and per their, um, per their forecasting uh, and per their model projections, this shows us the impact of masking versus not masking. So with universal masking protocols, uh, when you are looking at the green and orange lines at the bottom, those are, um, those are with universal masking uh, versus the teal and purple lines going up. You can see that over time at the bottom, so you're talking a number of days, which again, we're looking at over the course of a semester, what is the potential risk of susceptibility of students and the spread of COVID in your school environment? This is alarming to us, frankly, because um, if we're looking at operating, in the teal and purple areas, we won't be. 
we will be largely headed back to remote. Uh, and that is where no one wants to be. So if we're going to continue with in-seat instruction five days a week with that sense of quote unquote normalcy, um, I question, you know, do we as a community come together, put on the masks so that we can keep our kids in school? That's the bottom line. So our kids deserve that experience. Our kids deserve, they've been out of school, many of them 18 months or more. We've got a lot of catch up to do. We've got, you know, there's a lot, a lot of work that we have to get done with students and sending them back out on the computer at home does not help your student. So, um, so what can we do as a community to circumvent that? Uh, and I think that chart illustrates it well. So again, Julie, so this just illustrates again over the course of the semester, the probability of the susceptible students and the rate of infections uh, that we could see. Uh, so again, at the high end with, with uh, not having a mask mandate or having limited masking, we're setting ourselves up with, with risk. Uh, and a risk that I don't think many people want to get back into with, with remote. With universal masking, those numbers decrease, that risk decreases uh, dramatically. You know, 50, 60, 70 percent in some cases, that risk will, will diminish. So, um, you know, and of course, if you add uh, testing to that, random testing of students, it decreases that risk even more. So again, these are just slides that illustrate the risk and the degree of susceptibility with masking and testing. Uh, so go ahead, continue, Julie. So I want you to scroll down to the, to the summary. Again, these, these set of slides just show the, um, the impacts of masking versus not masking. But I think what, what we're jumping to, go ahead, continue, continue down. So what does this all mean? So to summarize the conversation is, we know this Delta variant on each is, side. is very uh, yeah. infectious. Uh, it is one that children yeah, are more susceptible for than, than previous uh, strains. Uh, we know that children are uh, from ages uh, birth to 12 are, are not yet eligible for that vaccine, uh, which leaves them unprotected. Um, we know that through, you know, through these enhanced models that without masking or limited masking or testing that we open up quite a window of risk for students and families. That, you know, certainly within one semester timeframe. Uh, and we know that masks and testing in combination, as I said, can prevent up to 40 to 70% of new infections. And frankly, a, re a reduction in infections keeps kids in school and it keeps all of us in school. So um, additional cases in the community, including those among the elderly, our grandparents, other family members, um, they're at risk. So even though the fatalities amongst children are low with the Delta variant. What they carry to their grandparents and to others in the family create a risk for them. And is that a risk we wanna to continue to, as we know that that population is, is highly at risk. More infected students leads to more days of absences. That's not only bad for the kids, but it's bad for families because now we're telling families, you gotta take time off work. You gotta be home with your student because they're out 10 to 14 days because they got a quarantine. I don't think anybody wants those phone calls. Um, we know that long COVID, the, the long-term effects can last in children 
up to eight months. We're dealing with, with students now with long COVID uh, issues. And then we're having to remediate those. Do we wanna see more of those? I don't think so. If you ask those families that have had to endure COVID with their children, I will tell you, it's not been a pleasurable experience. Next slide, Julie. So, you know, again, we don't wanna be on a path toward virtual learning. We've been there. We know the pains of virtual learning. We don't need students to fall further and further behind. Do we wanna take that risk as a community? Um, we, you know, the discussion on the table is how do we best position ourselves to keep kids in school and keep their routines intact, back with their friends, back with the socialization that they've missed, back from being behind a computer for 18 months to be back in school. And if it means wearing a mask to do so, that's what we do. I understand personal rights and all this, but what's the best for our community? And we all have to think from a community mind versus a self-centered individual mind. We need to keep these kids in school and we need to create strategies so that they, we afford them the experience of being in school they deserve. So um, that's what this presentation is predicated on. Uh, and again, these are the same conversations that Troy, Bloomfield, Birmingham, others have had and others are going to have this week, much like us, because what we're getting from our health officials, national, state, local, um, is a prognosis of this variant that is not good. It's not going to, it's going to get worse before it gets better is what we're all being told. So knowing that, knowing that, what are we doing to be proactive? You know, and this is moving very quickly because th three weeks ago, we had a different conversation because we had different sets of data in front of us three weeks ago. This is changing very rapidly. So uh, uh, when you go to the, uh, the recent county updates, so Julie, I'm gonna ask that you get out of this presentation and put up the, uh, the county sheets, primarily as they relate to the quarantine, there's a quarantine page. Well, well, first there's an introductory page. So let's look at the introductory page, which I think is kind of humorous in some sense. Uh, the cover letter, Julie, do you have that cover letter? Not, not that one, that one. So uh, if this is the introduction from the county that we received last week. Um, and I'm gonna point your attention to the middle of the page where it says some key points in the guidance and then it's followed by two bullets. So you'll see in the first bullet, now this is the Oakland County Health Department, it says universal masking is strongly recommended, not optional. Now, what does that mean? Strongly recommended, not optional. <laughs> when you get clarification from them, because they love to dance around the words, is, yeah, it's mandatory. They don't want to say it's mandatory, but they'll say it's not optional. So meaning that if you can wear a mask, if you can wear a mask medically, you should be wearing a mask. That's what they're saying here, is that the only folks that should not be wearing a mask are those that medically cannot tolerate a mask. Everyone else should wear a mask. That's the guidance, that's the verbiage coming from the health department. That is what they mean by strongly recommended, not optional. So, um, so with that, Julie, if you can put on the, the slide about the quarantining. So they changed, the quarantining, thank you, this one, if you scroll up a little bit. So the county has changed the quarantining guidelines, um, which has really helped to spur this conversation about masks in that um, 
if you have universal masking, your chances of quarantining are extremely diminished because you have all children who are masked. And if you're within that three feet boundary, or I'll say outside of that three foot boundary, then you'll notice in this chart, if everybody's masked in that incident, there's no quarantining. You don't have kids miss school. If you go with an optional mask policy, then you do have quarantining if you're within that three foot distance. And even the student who is masked has to quarantine if they're with the student who's unmasked within three feet and there's an exposure. So even though you're masked, if you're around somebody who's not masked and there's an exposure, even the, the masked student has to quarantine assuming they're not vaccinated. So that's a game changer for schools in terms of keeping kids in school. This was one of the frustrations we had throughout last year in the spring when we were back in seat with the number of students quarantining is, is that this, this guidance didn't exist. Everybody was quarantined regardless. This one, they've moved now to saying that if everybody's masked, and you're within that, that distance, which we're all positioning ourselves to be in, whether they're in the classroom or the cafeteria, then we're not having to quarantine. So our rates of quarantine should, should diminish. And if you extrapolate that out, the less quarantines that we have, the less of a chance there is to quarantine an entire classroom, the less of a chance there is to, to quarantine an entire school, or frankly, for all of us to go back remote again. So, um, so the changes in these dynamics of quarantining have really changed the way districts have thought about masking because we have to think about self-preservation and keeping our kids with the in-seat school experience. Hey, Dr. Shores, before you continue, this is Sean, I apologize. I'm, I'm en route to the meeting, <laughs> but I haven't quite made it yet. Yeah. So looking at this slide, we're less than three feet, but the intention that, that we're going for is that we would be able to do social distancing at least three feet within the buildings and even in the cafeteria, because I know that was a concern right. from a lot of the parents. Sure, correct. So, you know, our cafeteria seating, uh, Chartwells, which is our food service uh, uh uh, provider as well as our administrators, you know, we've set up, you know, a, a three foot distance between students uh, or more uh, in cafeterias. In fact, at the upper levels, uh, middle school, high school, we're using different um, uh, rooms or facilities within the facility to have lunch. So yeah, there's the lunch room, and then there's the auxiliary gym, or there's another area that students are going to where we're, we're uh, you know, spacing kids out. Uh, you know, and the same thing with, with classrooms, we're moving, you know, to, to the extent feasible uh, to that three foot boundary. Now, kids are kids and, you know, is there a three foot boundary at every, every point in time in the day with those kids? We can't guarantee that. But are we, are we setting ourselves up to be mindful of that as we are, um, as we are educating our students or feeding our students? You know, absolutely. Okay, thanks for the clarification. Does that mean yes. that we would not have to do contact tracing? So we still do contact tracing. So that is, uh, so when there is an exposure, we still go through that contact tracing and we, we have to establish uh, the, um, uh, the three, you know, the extension of the three foot boundary. So we do have to contact trace to establish the boundary uh, to which that incident took place. And then we kind of move in using this guideline as to where we go in terms of whether we quarantine or not. And if that student's been vaccinated or not. So the, we start to look at all those variables. So Carrie Quitmeyer, who is our uh, school district nurse, uh, is our point person for uh, contact tracing and is working with all the uh, administrators and staff uh, as those cases come up. 
and she's also the liaison to Oakland County Health Department as well. So that that continuous loop of communication and reporting uh, is still had with all of that. So a question about the vaccination variable. We aren't asking who's been vaccinated, but I did recently mm -hmm. just find out that it's reported on MICR. So are we using that information to determine vaccination status if this type of scenario happens? That is one point that we can take a look at. Yep. We can look at MICRs to get that information. We don't ask folks, uh, but if, it's a, if that information is available to us through that venue that we're able to, to view, then we can look at that. I'm just thinking in terms of whatever we can do to keep them mm -hmm. in school. Okay. Other questions or commentary or from the board? Hi, Hi Dr. Schwartz. Um, I have a question about the I'm school I'm, I'm sorry. Um, this is not a public discussion. This okay. is a discussion okay. with sorry. the board. Yep, when okay. we get to public comments, you're welcome to give any statements you'd like. Um, Dr. Schwartz, I don't mean to make a left right now because uh, we've been talking primarily about students, but I'd like to understand what this means for visitors, volunteers, guests, staff, indoor, outdoor sports, yep. uh, certainly a lot more farther reaching than just our classroom. Sure. So I'm glad you asked. So, you know, when we look at our policies, so if, we, if, we're, if we're looking at a universal mask policy, it becomes just what that says. It's a universal mask policy, which means that extends to students. It extends to staff. Uh, it extends to visitors to the building. Uh, all of those situations where anybody's coming inside the building, there would be a mandate. Now, right now, outdoors is, is, is fine uh, to not have a mask. So when we start to talk about athletics, what does this mean for athletics? Because this is kind of where this comes into play is, uh, you know, athletics would be um, if you're an outdoor, then it's, it's simply masks optional if you're outdoor. Uh, if you're indoor, however, uh, if you're an athlete, if you're in the, in the field of play or in competition, you do not have to have a mask. But if you are a spectator, you're considered a visitor and you would have a mask as a spectator indoors. Um, that would be my recommendation uh, is that we treat all visitors, spectators included, all under the same umbrella. Um, MHSAA, our athletic organization, uh, has not weighed in on uh, any of this uh, um, mask conversation as of yet. Um, and so looking at you know, other districts, again, that uh, are uh, having these conversations, they are following suit in much the same way uh, in terms of the um, uh, visitors, all visitors, which include spectators, um, having masks. Uh, and with staff, uh, you know, again, staff would have masks as well. And, and I know there are certainly pros and cons to staff having masks. Uh, particularly with elementary staff and being able to see the teacher's face, read lips, facial expressions, all of those things that are more critical at the elementary level. We totally got that. We totally understand that. And that's a very legitimate reason. Uh, we also know that there, you know, um, there's an example too that we need to set for students um, with the wearing of masks. Uh, and we're asking vaccinated and unvaccinated folks throughout the district to wear them. Uh, we know we have cases that of, of vaccinated folks who have COVID currently. So just because you have the vaccine doesn't make it 100%, decreases your chances 
dramatically, but it doesn't make it 100%. So I guess I mean all means all uh, in keeping it to that uh, perspective. You know, I would look at, uh, frankly, for uh, if I'm looking at a proposal in moving forward, uh, I'd be looking at uh, pre-K through grade eight as being required. Nine through 12 would be highly recommended, um, but required when the district county risk level is in either the substantial or high category, which right now Oakland County is high. Uh, that's been changed in the last three weeks. We've moved from substantial to high in this amount of time uh, as well. Um, and then we would re-examine those, uh, we would re-examine where we're at at the end of our first trimester. Um, and, or if there's a dramatic decrease uh, in county transmissions uh, that takes us beneath the um, substantial level, you know, I think the board would come back and, and revisit that. Um, I, I split that up between pre-K and, and uh, pre-K eight and nine through 12, because uh, right now nine through 12 is, uh, there's a higher rate of vaccination with that group as it exists right now. Um, we don't know when children under 12 will be vaccinated. Um, I'm hearing late fall that may be available. And so if we're looking at a, um, uh, having masks until around the end of the first try, which puts us at about Thanksgiving, puts us in that time frame that we're hearing those vaccines will become available. Uh, at least that's kind of what we're what we're hearing so and keeping it through grade eight makes sense to us for a couple of reasons because um, right now we have many 11 year olds in grade six how do you make one grade level in a school mandatory and the others not um, and we also have our gate uh, magnet school which runs grade two through eight and so how do you make a partial school mandated versus the other not. So it just, it, it's cleaner just to say it's pre-K eight required till that date, nine through 12, it's required when we're in substantial or high risk level. Uh, and, and then the board can revisit that at a point or any point they want, but particularly at points where we dip beneath a substantial level um, or we just reevaluate at the end of the first trimester and see where we're at with, with the vaccination status availability and such at that point in time. So that would be where I sit with recommendations at this point in time. So Dr. Schwartz, you alluded to it earlier um, about uh, staff masking. Um, are we taking steps with our special education kids? And maybe Ms. Monroe can chime in on this about those. And you did allude to it, the fact that they sometimes need to be able to see the faces and the lips. Um, I, I worry about that particular population of, of students that we have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, Ms. Monroe, if you want to, I know we have many special education teachers that choose to wear a face shield so you can still see the expressions and the and the the lip movements and and the speech and all of that, but Miss Monroe, you may have some further input into that as well. We have uh, all clear masks and uh, face shields, both children's size and adult size, available. Uh, those we have they're plentiful, so if any building is ever in need, um, I can replenish that at any time. We also continue to keep on hand um, any of the sneeze guards, the clear sneeze guards. Uh, many of our students in our smaller self-contained classrooms uh, were uncomfortable using that tool. Uh, they would rather uh, have the distance uh, and teachers um, kind of shared that sentiment, but we continue to make that accessible. We also um, do have some students who have a medical condition or cannot independently uh, put on or take off their mask. And that is one of the requirements, both, um, or one of the guidelines, both from a federal and a state guideline is that uh, students be able to 
put on and off their mask independently. Uh, so we do have some students who we know that it's not a possibility for. Uh, specifically, the face shields and the clear masks um, are very useful for our students who need to be able to see those expressions, special education or general education. So those are, those are available um, for any student and staff member. Thank you. So if we go as part of our, you know, I, I'm asking probably a rhetorical question, but um, if we go back to a mask mandate being part of our protocols, um, you know, I, I don't disagree that there is plenty of science out there that shows that masks, um, you know, are, are hindrance to, to children in some way, whether that be uh, socially, emotionally, whether that be physically, something like that. There's lots of science on both sides of this, and I think that's what makes it tough for us board members. Right. But I, is there this, the medical exception that those parents that wish for their children not to wear a mask, um, you know, I say this very whimsically, but I certainly don't mean it disrespectfully, could go to their pediatrician and say, here's the science. I don't want my child wearing a mask. Here's the form. Um, and if that medical science exists, then their pediatrician should be able to opt them out, correct? So yeah, just like we did last spring, we allowed for medical exemptions for those families that, you know, there was a medical intolerance for a mask. And we, we had a handful of those in the district that we uh, obliged. Uh, and the same would be true here. I mean, we essentially would follow the same that we've all been through already last spring. Mm -hmm. It'd be the same protocols. And uh, is, is part of your recommendation, Dr. Shares, I know we touched on this. Uh, we had put down, if memory serves, in our, the protocols that we approved earlier, there was not a, a distance. It, we, we would make best efforts. How are you want to word that? that we're to the extent feasible. Yeah. To the extent feasible. Correct. Um, is, is part of your recommendation tonight, because I do share the concern that if with the data we've been shown that you know, I understand in halls and passing and things like that, that we're not going to be able to maintain that. But in classrooms, in fixed seating areas, mm -hmm. um, you know, man, made, maintaining that three foot distance, if we're going to go backwards to some of the other things, I think that that was one of the things that gave our, our public some uh, solace, at least that we did have some distance in the classrooms and the lunchrooms. Yes. And that is something, again, that we've all been working to secure. Uh, as we are setting up, as we were setting up for this week, in fact, is mm -hmm. that that three foot minimum distance, you know, when we talk three foot, it's really, it's three foot from mouth to mouth, not three foot from desk edge to desk edge. It's really from, you know, expiration to expiration or inhalation to, you know, mm -hmm. that distance. Uh, and so uh, that is something that, again, we're working with Chartwells with, in setting up all of our cafeteria setups. Uh, as well as our, our classrooms, you know, uh, are pretty much all in a traditional mode right now of instruction mm -hmm. um, to, as we start. Dr. Sure, just to add to Mr. Lang's comment, with the, the medical waiver, so it's not an opt-out, it's a medical waiver that we're looking for at this point, right? It's a medical waiver, yeah. Okay, so it's not, I'm just trying to, from a clarification standpoint, is it, is it a situation where parents that don't want their children to wear masks would just sign a, it's not one of those situations where you come to the office and sign a sheet, it's an actual medical waiver that you would actually get from the doctor is what we're Correct. anticipating? It's, okay. it, we need to have a doctor's statement to say, yes, indeed, there is a, a medical uh, reasoning behind the, the recommendation. Okay. And just to add, we have retained all of those from uh, last year. So any students that uh, had that completed so that families don't have to go back to their physician, it would be new enrollees or students who may have a new medical condition um, since the last school year that would need to have the physician statement. Thank you, Ms. Monroe. Thank, Thank you. That's good information. So, Dr. Swartz, to add to, to Chip's statement, for, thanks for bringing that up, Chip. Um, having masks strongly recommended but optional for the teachers, if there's ever a point to where the teacher is just not able to communicate to the class, I think they're adult enough to be able to 
make the choice to say, you know, I have to remove my mask for at least a moment to get my point across. I'm 10 feet away from the nearest kid. I mean, is that going to be an issue or is there uh, a way we can put language in there for that? I mean, we're here to educate. <laughs> I, I know. I know. This is where it gets to be a sticky wicket because it's, you know, you know, I think. I think there's there perhaps could be occasions where there is a teacher that needs to, you know, from a distance. Extenuate uh, or accentuate, I'll say their. Uh, you know, their, their voice or extenuate their uh, facial expression or something of that nature where they may pull their mask down or something. And, and if, if there's a distance that's involved, I mean, it's going to be on discretion. Um, I think those are probably situations that are okay. You know, again, um, we need to navigate this to the best benefit possible. Uh, that we can and and there's going to be situations where yeah that that would be appropriate if if the distance allows uh, you know in in my opinion and i know that's a concern amongst we heard from several elementary teachers where that's a concern uh and and, it, and rightfully so i understand that concern yeah well i i didn't respond to many of the letters so we did get plenty of them i i to assure our, our public that we read every single one of those. And I think that that was one of the biggest question marks I had coming in is knowing that, you know, uh, almost 70% of communication is done non-verbally. Um, and, and that's where I'm challenged in the classroom setting. And I'm weighing that against the example setting, especially at the elementary level where we're going to be looking at masks and, and them example setting uh, as well. And I'm looking at, you know, I, I'm struggling with what's the greater good there is um, that, that communication or the greater good with the, uh, with that. So just personally. Now, continuing with the other mitigations, you know, that we've discussed prior, those would continue to stay in place. So when we talk about hand washing breaks, again, hand washing is another huge preventative uh, in this disease. Uh, and so having frequent hand washing breaks is something that we uh, obviously are, are going to implement and continue. Uh, the social distancing we talked about in terms of that three foot plus distancing uh, where feasible as much as possible mask breaks so we would be working into the, the schedule breaks for students with their masks uh, they would not need to have their masks when they're outdoors so when we talk about recess or or uh, uh, other you know classes going outside for either educational or recreational reasons they would not have to have a mask uh, but being cognizant of, of working in those mask breaks. Uh, with universal masking, the guidance tells us that uh, daily screening isn't necessary. Uh, they are suggesting uh, or recommending strongly that there is screening when there is not universal masking. But if you're going to universal masking, that daily screening is not uh, as uh, pertinent to have. Uh, so that would be something, again, we would continue to not have if we, if we are moving toward the universal masking. Uh, the contact tracing, which Ms. Washington asked about, yep, we're going to, we continue with the contact tracing, uh, as we spoke to earlier. International travel, we're going to, we would follow the international travel guidelines as, as uh, espoused by the CDC uh, ver with vaccinated uh, and unvaccinated individuals. So we'd be following that protocol closely pertaining to quarantining. Uh, visitors, again, all visitors would be masked, whether you are a, a volunteer or you're a spectator, uh, you, you would be masked. Um, we would dis uh, continue to discourage large scale assemblies, trying to break things down into smaller groups uh, as we do uh, uh, assemblies. Cleaning, uh, the deep, uh, the cleaning schedules, uh, the cleaning schedules in terms of making sure uh, on multiple points in the day, we are hitting high touch surfaces, that being doorknobs, railings, uh, handles, uh, those types of things. Uh, and then of course, uh, wide availability of sanitizer uh, in the buildings, masks uh, for students, uh, 
you know, continuing with, uh, again, having all of those available. So those would be the continued mitigations that I would recommend. And of course, that buses are mandatory. And buses are mandatory, <laughs> yes. That's the one, one we missed last time, so. Yes. And I do want to acknowledge, I see Ms. or Mr. King with their hand up. Um, we will be getting to public comment shortly, so please do keep your hand up and we'll have public addressing us shortly here. So Dr. Schwartz, all of those items have been budgeted for. They're in the classrooms, they're in the schools. So that's already in place anyway, correct? Yes, yeah. So all of that material, the sanitizer, the masks, uh, we have plenty. I think we ordered 100,000 masks last year. So we have plenty of masks uh, and gallons of sanitizer. So no shortage there. Uh, we also have equipment um, and materials for you know, the fogging, uh, the disinfecting, uh, all of that that we were into, uh, we still have plenty of that material left as well. So, yes. Dr. Shores, you also mentioned the importance of, or not the importance, but the, uh, the understanding of universal masks are done at the elementary through eighth. We wouldn't necessarily need daily screenings, but with the proposal that it wouldn't be at the high school, would you incorporate daily screenings at the high school level or you don't see that as being needed? At this time, I would not think that that's needed. Now, might there be a time in the future that we'd have to think about that? Perhaps, depending on how trajectory goes. But to clarify, we will have masking as long as we're in substantial or substantial high level. Substantial or high level would be my recommendation. And that's consistent with, again, Troy and the districts around us. Got it. Thank you. And Dr. Schwartz, that's by Oakland County through the reporting through the health department? Correct. That's our source. Great. Thanks. That is our source. Correct. Any other questions from the board for Dr. Schwarz or? Okay. Anything else, Dr. Schwarz? No, I, that's, you know, that's where we stand in place and time with our current set of data, our current set of projections um, and conversation about prevention. So I know none of this is easy and Again, there are opinions from every conceivable spectrum on this issue. Um, but I think we need to step back again, as I spoke to at the beginning of the presentation, and, and we got to think about this issue as a community um, and about what our kids deserve. So. All right. Thank you, Dr. Schwartz. Thank you, fellow board members. Um, so as we've done, we've reached item uh, three on our agenda. This is a citizen's request to address the board. This is a time for public participation during the board meeting. Uh, we do ask that you limit your statement to three minutes. We do have a number of people I'm sure tonight that would like to address the board. Uh, this is a time really for one-way communication. Uh, you're welcome to make a statement to the board. If you have a question that we need to follow up on, if you can just let us know and we'll follow up after this meeting. Um, uh, sometime in the near future so that we can get you if you've got additional information you're looking for, things of that nature. But this really isn't a time for uh, back and forth dialogue per se. As we've done in the past, uh, we do have a couple of folks who have decided to join us. Mr. McCord, I believe, if I remember, and, and, and another Mr. McCord, is that okay? Thank you, uh, who have decided to join us this evening. And, and we will uh, get the folks that are in the room for their public comment first. Those of you who are on Zoom, if you mouse over the reactions button at the bottom of your screen and click on that, there is a raise hand button on there. If you click your raise hand button, if you'd like to address the board this evening, that'll put you in queue. Once we get through the in-person folks, we'll start going through our virtual audience as well. So um, with that, Mr. McCord, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. I don't know if, if this is working. Is this working? You're on. Okay. Yes, thank you. Um, well, I was very happy to see that you had the, the Cove Sim um, model because that was what I was actually 
planning to speak on. Um, however, I would like to clarify because something that I don't know that you were completely clear on was that that model uses um, the assumption that all, I mean, you did talk about it, but I don't know how clear it was, was to everyone here. That, that model bases its assumptions on the fact that all immunized and people who have had COVID are completely immune, which is not true. And so the numbers that are capable of being generated using that model are, are much higher than what that model shows there. Uh, if, we, if you assume that people who have had it before can get it now with the Delta variant and, and people who have, Im, have been immunized and have been immunized previously and have had their effective immunization level decreased over time. Uh, and so that's something else to, to keep in mind. And then also with the, uh, the universal masking mandate uh, idea, something else to think about um, is how, are, how is the, man, the masks uh, going to be enforced, especially with, I have seen parents in the area discussing openly on social media, fake masks, masks that look real, but are not, they do nothing. And that, and, and, and with, with parents sending their kids to school with those, it effectively does away with the idea of, of everyone wearing masks and takes us back to, we don't know. And so that, that's really all I wanted to talk about and, and bring to your attention. Thank you. Oh, sorry, thank you, Mr. McCord, appreciate that. Uh, the other Mr. McCord, are you gonna join us on the mic tonight or just, all right, well, thank you for participating tonight. All right, with that again, as a reminder, uh, if your reactions button, Oh, you're going to listen in. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Okay. Uh, again, as a reminder, at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there's a reactions button. Uh, if you click on that, there's a raise hand button uh, by signifying you like. We will get uh, Julie Kelly here to start running our list. Um, and if we get to three minutes, I will st step in and ask you to wrap your comments up, please. Okay, Julie. Okay. A. King, could you please state your full name? Uh, yes, good evening, Andrew King. Thank you, Mr. King. Yes, um, so my wife and I have three kids in the school district, and we do not support masking. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. King. Appreciate that. David Hanna? Or I'm sorry, Durant, Durant, Durant. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. I have two. I have two kids in the district, and I'm against masking, but I believe in science. What Dr. Schultz was reading off of, it's a projective of numbers that he's reading off of, and when the COVID started. There was a whole bunch of scientists that projected all kinds of numbers of how many people were going to die, how many people were going to catch it. And those numbers never hit where they needed to hit. So all we're doing is guessing is what we're doing. And, and, and we're playing the guessing of numbers is what we're doing with our kids. And my kids, first day of school, both don't want to come back to school because of the masking. And me and my wife both have underlying conditions. We're not vaccinated. And I go to work every day and I deal with the public every day for the last two and a half years. All I say is, let science be science and predict what science plays out, not a projective of numbers that people keep saying. That goes from Oakland County, that goes from CDC, goes from the president, goes from whoever it comes from. It's all a bunch of numbers that are just rattling you off that no one knows what's gonna happen. And I appreciate everybody putting their in, input in from doctor to everyone on the board and everything else. But we need to start thinking about the kids and having their freedom of sitting there in the classroom 
and be unable to express themselves. And they express themselves, a lot of kids, with their face. Can't even see who it is anymore. You can have a kid today that went to school for a month and that kid takes that mask off. The teacher don't even know that that kid is in her class or he in his class. Yes, they do. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hanna. Appreciate that. Rachel Rich. Um, I, is my video on? I can't yep. tell. Yeah, okay. you're on. Hi, you guys. Um, we have a daughter. She's in first grade at Deerfield Elementary. Um, and here it goes. With the rate of vaccinations in Oakland County, paired with the amount of households COVID has already blown through in our community, we feel strongly that our district is in a position to give the families the right to choose. Life is full of risks. Our children are at risk on playgrounds, playing sports, riding in cars, and from countless other viruses and cancers, not to mention bad situations at home. Life is hard, and although we wish we could shelter our daughter from everything in this ugly world, we can't. Our children have a greater chance of death or suffering long-term mental and physical ramifications from any one of the things I just listed than they do from COVID. Everyone 12 and older in our nation has access to vaccinations. Children have a higher chance of being vectors than from suffering from long-term complications. This constant bombardment of fear needs to stop. Children, especially the younger ones, need connection. And this is true for all children, not just the children that we have with special needs. They need to see the reassuring smiles from their peers and teachers. Seeing each other's facial expressions, age, and teaching our children emotional intelligence and the understanding of certain social cues. Children need to clearly hear what is being said to them from their classmates and their teachers in order to continue to learn and hone skills and proper speech and enunciation. These are skills that are imperative for reading and writing, not just for mental development. Masks take away some of the most basic human interactions. They dull the senses that we were all given for a reason. Please reflect on your summer. Have you or your children played sports? Have you had family or friend get-togethers? Visited your favorite restaurants? Attend a church, a concert, or a sporting event? Maybe you've gone on vacation. If we have partaken in any of these things without a mask, and now we feel the only way to stay safe is to cover our children's faces with a cloth mask of all things. Shame on us even with the numbers higher in our community. If you're out and about, our community is hopping. Events are going on all over the place still. We believe that our children will pay a price if we continue to rob our children of a carefree childhood. We are filling their heads with worry and fear and covering two thirds of their faces. We are delusional if we think our children aren't feeling the effects as well. Cut a head of hair, mow a lawn, sand some drywall. There will be particles in your cloth mass after, particles much larger than COVID. Let's not pretend our children are walking around in school wearing N95s because they're not. And if things are so dire, why was an emergency board meeting called last week and yet here we are the evening after our children's first day of school? That hypocrisy is hard for my husband and I to swallow. Yes, there was a request to wear masks today, but the meeting wasn't important enough to get done before today. I ask you to keep with the previous vote and leave the choice in the hands of the parents. And if we're supposed to come together as a community with mitigation strategies, why was it so hard for us to continue with the health questionnaires? It's a simple thing that would help parents be held accountable. So thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Rich. Erin Molnar. Hello, uh, my name is Erin. I have a third grader at GATE. I just want to reiterate my support for universal masking, which means requiring masks regardless of vaccination status. I was heartened to hear Dr. Schwartz support this as well. To the board members, I know this is unfair that these decisions have been passed to school boards and that you're facing a lot of input from all sides, as we can hear. From a health and safety standpoint, however, nothing has actually changed since masks were required previously. You've already made this decision in the past. Our kids under 12 are still unvaccinated. The pandemic is still ongoing and community transmission is still high. 
Every single public health authority at the federal, state, and local level recommends universal masking, and all you need to do is follow their recommendations. <clears throat> Dr. Schwartz mentioned, Schwartz mentioned that no one on the board is a public health expert, so I urge you the abundance of guidance that the experts have given you. Your obligation and job is to ensure kids are safe and that they are receiving a free, appropriate, and equitable public, public education. I think as experts in education, they would agree that virtual learning is not appropriate for most kids or equitable for all. That <clears throat> the way we stay in school and give our kids what they need, which is in-seat time with their teachers and peers, is to require masks. If we do not require masks, we will be doing virtual school. I also agree with some of the board members that facial signals and nonverbal communication are extremely important, especially at the early elementary level. My own kid is in a general ed classroom, but has issues communicating and understanding social cues. I would ask if you do have a stockpile of clear mask options, that those be made more readily available. It sounds like maybe people don't know they're available or don't know how to get them. Um, so maybe you could proactively hand them out to teachers so they're encouraged to use them, especially in our younger grades. Um, as mentioned, and we all know by now, the COVID situation can change rapidly. I would ask going forward if metrics are not already established, it sounds like maybe some are, that there are automatic triggers and metrics put into place where we default to some of these mitigation measures. Uh, it seems like this would make things a heck of a lot easier on all of you and avoid constant uncertainty for families and rehashing of the same information over and over if there were just kind of some set metrics where we go back to certain mitigation measures, including masking, testing, et cetera. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Ms. Molinar. Melissa Watton. Actually, this is Michael Watton. Um, got a little bit here, so I'll try and make it quick. Previously at the last board meeting, I do believe the board voted to go to recommended mask, not requiring them. That, and that wouldn't change unless there was a mandate from the CDC or the MDHHS. That hasn't changed, so we, aren't, we shouldn't even be here. Currently, as of 3 p.m. today, the majority of public schools in Oakland County are not requiring them. Only a handful are, and only a handful that are surrounding our district, specifically Bloomfield and Troy. Um, let's see here. Sorry, got a bunch of notes. Um, latest uh, transmission rates show that children are not the highest vector. Ages 20 to 29 are the, are the highest, 30 to 39 are the second highest, and kids from 2 to 19 are actually the lowest of those three. Um, and then we were talking, I heard it earlier, they were talking about the you know, setting an example. Last week at the teacher's breakfast, it was probably half and half, and we were already in high. Half the teachers were wearing masks, half were not. So now you're asking our kids to require it when even when we're high, it wasn't enforced with the staff. There were people, administrators, administrators walking around today going to schools not wearing masks. I, my, my children and other members of the community who I know have informed me of this. And since today was requested, I would like the board at some point to email my wife or myself. I'm sure you have our emails. We've sent you enough emails. I would like somebody to answer why high school was being mandated. My son was stopped in the hallway and told repeatedly and given a mask that he had to wear it. So if it was only a request at this point, why, was, why would we be enforced to? Um, at this point, I think we're basing it off projections, which I understand it is, we don't want this to get serious any more than it already is, but we have to wait and see what the science says and see what we're doing because we're doing more harm than good to these kids by constantly going, nope, you're out of mask. Nope, you're in a mask. I agree with Rach, um, Ms. Rich or Mrs. Rich when she said 
if this was that important, we should have had this meeting last week, well before the kids started school. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Watt. And I know that Dr. Schwartz is over here taking notes about uh, your concern there at the high school as well, so. Um, is it Suj Sastry? Hi, thank you. Yes, I have a daughter that attends the eighth grade at the middle school. Um, I just want to, first of all, thank you all for being on top of things. I know things are ever changing and you are running last minute to hold these meetings. So I appreciate that. Um, coming from a medical genetics and counseling background, I do sincerely feel for the children who are in the younger grades, elementary, um, who really do have to deal with a lot of the social cues, the expressions, et cetera. I ask that the board makes very much available these clear masks to any family who needs them, as I think that may help with some of those issues. I can't, um, I can't, I, like I said, I feel very sad, saddened for a lot of the family members, a lot of the patients, a lot of the people in our community who have to deal with wearing masks, but I do strongly encourage wearing of masks to mitigate this spread. I also want to ask the board, though I don't think you'll have an answer now, but I want you to think about this. What if a child is vaccinated, wearing a mask, are they, they're going to be exposed at some point. I really want to know what the quarantine issue is going to be for them. If my child is vaccinated, my child is wearing a mask, I very much do not want them quarantined for 10 to 12 days, missing school and the education that they deserve. So I know you posted that slide. I'm hoping that you guys will consider what will need to be done regardless of what this mask vote turns out to be, because that is a huge concern for me. I do not want my child missing school because she was exposed to someone who has COVID. I appreciate the time, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sostry. Sarah, please state your full name. Hello, this is actually Alessandro. Um, I am Sarah's uh, husband, it's Alessandro Testa. So first of all, I would thank uh, Mr. Schwartz for the uh, comprehensive presentation and evaluation. I heard other parents saying that uh, whatever is being presented is not based on science. Honestly, I disagree with that. I think whatever is being presented are results from a study made by scientists. You can uh, disagree, but these are data, are studies. For sure, there are assumptions behind that as any other scientific study, but anyhow, those assumptions are giving a quite evident trend. A trend that should be evident just looking back to the past 18 months. I mean that whoever, uh, wore a mask, a face mask, had a lower probability to get the infection. So following uh, this, I fully agree with Mr. Schwartz's recommendation to impose to our children wear masks. It's not an easy decision, I agree with that, but I think uh, that's the best option. That's the best option to allow them to stay on seat in the coming months and guarantee their safety and the safety of their parents and their relatives. So I strongly uh, agree what has been presented. Again, I will thank uh, Mr. Schwartz for the for clarity of the presentation. It, again, it's not an easy decision for the board, but I think we, we are approaching fall and we know how hard has been past year independently if the parents has decided to stay remote or on seat. And I think that uh, uh, making the decision now is better than wait, maybe as other uh, <clears throat> school districts are doing. I mean, better to stay on the safe side and impose now 
rather than changing back and forth during the fall, or B, even in the position to be forced to shut down uh, full school building for outbreaks. So again, thank you, Mr. Schwartz, for presenting that. In saying this, uh, what I want, I didn't understand, honestly, maybe uh, what you mentioned, uh, what is not clear to me and maybe is, uh, is a suggestion or something you, I would ask you to look for, um, what we can do to mitigate further the risk in the cafeteria. Because the child there, uh, I'm assuming will not wear the mask, will be stared there for more than 20 minutes, which is above the, the uh, 15 minutes, which is one of the constraints uh, to determine if there, there are risk or not. And even if, uh, uh, I don't know exactly which is the distance that could be kept, you, I think you mentioned more than three feet, but I don't know if we can reach six feet, you can reach consistently six feet among children. And then the big question mark, I think, I know that is challenging is how to do contact tracing in that case. I don't, I am not sure if you are assuming uh, or you are trying to impose fixed yes. seats or the, the seating will be. Uh, Thank you, sir. I'm sorry, so your time's expired. Yeah, this is something I would ask uh, the board to think of. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Maureen Sharp. Hello, my name is Maureen Sharp. I have two children at Deerfield Elementary. And I wanna thank doc Dr. Schwartz for calling this meeting as this has weighed heavily on my heart. Let me begin by saying that I'm astonished this meeting even needs to take place. I really expected more from our community. I've heard this board state that kids at education is their number one priority, but what are we teaching them if we are not, if we are ignoring facts? What example are we setting for them if we can't follow basic guidelines of pe that people who have dedicated their own lives to learn in order to save people? If you are not following science, math, or data, that has continuously been available to you, how as, can we, as parents can we expect to have confidence that you are capable in properly educating our kids? The Board of Education is not qualified to set medical guidelines. That's why the organizations such as the CDC, MDHS, WHO, Oakland County Health Department, and the American Academy of Pediatrics exists. All strongly urge everyone to wear a mask whether vaccinated or not. These are all organizations that you yourself have referenced. But let me add another one for you. It's the ADA, the American Disabilities Act. It has been drilled in our heads that parents are not to send any kind of snack or lunch that contains nuts. We have a nut-free school and that's in order to keep kids with allergies safe. This accommodation that parents and educators have made for those students. Why shouldn't accommodations apply to the immunocompromised during a global pandemic? Title II of the American Disabilities Act states that reasonable accommodations are expected to allow students to be able to access the curriculum. The district, require, the district is required by law to provide FAPE, which is a free appropriate public education. And this includes a safe environment for them to learn. For years, I've had to provide documentation for my kids' medical needs. These documents had to be, cannot be signed by anybody on this board. It has to be signed by a medical professional who is, has, who is a doctor that has experience. Our medical community is exhausted. They are experiencing burnout and they are leaving their jobs that they love because we are not listening to them. They have been on the front lines. They've seen what COVID can do in the elderly and the normal, I'm sorry, <laughs> and the elderly and, and adults and in children. And it does not matter about core mobility sometimes, most of it, it's the virus doesn't pick and choose. This Delta variant is serious. The transmission rate in comparison to the previous strains of the virus is almost incomprehensible. The virus is remaining stagnant in the air. It is an aerosol. And that means that if someone has been infected, it is still in the air even after they have left the room. And unfortunately, majority of hospitalizations are for, are for are unvaccinated. This includes children who are unable or are too young to get the vaccine. 
in the end, if we find out that masks were not needed and that it wasn't as important as the organizations say that it is, that's if that's the worst that's going to happen, then I can live with that. I can live yeah. with extra precautions. But what I cannot Thank live you, with Mr. Sharp. is a child or staff member dying. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Bob McDougall. Uh, thank you. Um, I have uh, two children uh, in the Avondale School District. Um, one we've decided actually to pull out, uh, sadly, because there was no mask mandate. Uh, the second we've opted to send to the virtual uh, option, which is which is not ideal. Uh, as everyone has mentioned, you know, face to face, the social emotional component of being in person, it, it is very important. But we made the decision as, as a family to protect the health and well-being of our child above all else. Um, I would hope that the board would make the same decision. Sounds like we are going in that direction, hopefully, uh, and would impose a mask mandate on these, on these children. Uh, health is the most important thing. Uh, an education doesn't matter if you, if you don't have a body and a brain to use it. Um, we should be listening to our scientists, our doctors, people that have been trained. These are trained professionals. Um, we, should, we should be listening to them uh, above, over anybody else. Uh, politics, political agendas, put those aside. Um, we're, asking to put, we're asking people, children, to put a piece of cloth over their nose and their mouth. Uh, this isn't a discussion on whether or not you should get a vaccine. We're asking you to put a piece of cloth over your nose and your mouth. Um, that seems like a very small request, a very simple request. Um, we should be doing that. Um, everybody should be. Even if you are, even if you have a vaccine, the breakthrough, uh, the breakthrough percentages for Delta, they're high, even for those who are fully vaccinated. Even if you've had COVID prior, um, sadly, we, it's, it's 16 and up, the FDA. Um, or to, to receive a vaccine, um, 12 and up if, uh, if you have a, um, a medical reason to get that vaccine. So for, for our K through fifth and sixth graders, they have no option. Uh, the only option for them is to get the, is to get the virus uh, to, to develop an immunity to it. So anything we can do prior to the release of this vaccine to our, our young children, uh, we should take that precaution, yes. A mask, very simple ask. It's it's probably harder to to keep a group of kindergartners, you know, at a three foot distance than than to have them put a piece of cloth over their face. And it's yes, I, I do understand the the impact this has to uh, to seeing the lips and to and to really connecting with your students and your uh, and your teacher, but that is temporary. Uh, a virus like this could potentially kill you. And that, that's, a, that's an unacceptable risk. Uh, so again, thank you for the board and to Dr. Schwartz for calling this meeting. Thank you, Mr. McDougall. Trinice Layton. Hello. Um, my name is Trinice Layton. I am a uh, nurse, a neurology nurse, um, and I also have two daughters in the school district, one at Woodland, one at Auburn, um, doing the early childhood education. Um, I would like to first commend the board for bringing this meeting, and I am not um, in envy of you all having to make such a difficult decision, but I do appreciate what you're doing today. I wanted to... Um, say that what we are asking is in benefit of our children and to wear the mask is, is beneficial to them. This is going to help save lives. And I think even one child intubated in a hospital because of COVID is too much. We've talked, I've heard parents talk about, well, there are so many risks out in the world. We cannot protect our children from everything. And to that, it, that is fact. But if we could protect our children by doing this small act, 
I see no reason why we shouldn't do this. Uh, we're not, it's not being, this is not a hard ask. I've seen how these children are adaptable, how they have shown that they are resilient. They can put on a mask. If you would have asked me two years ago, um, would I see a group of kindergartners wearing a mask? I would have said that you're insane. Um, but I have seen it. I have seen first graders, second graders, and up, and they have shown that they can do this. In fact, we are the ones who are um, in their way. They can do this. We need to stand aside and let our children um, wear masks and show how important that this, situ this situation is. I heard someone else say, we need to wait and see what the science says. The science has already said it, that the variant is more contagious. Um, that these numbers are climbing. So we need to wear the mask. It, it, it cannot be more clear. We talk about these risks. There is a risk associated with getting in a vehicle, but you still put on a seatbelt because that is what you do to take an extra step of precaution to save yourself. There is a risk associated with children going to school and we are asking that they wear the mask and that the mask mandate stay in place. As I've said, um, being a nurse, I have seen, I'm working 12 hour shifts at night, which really turned into 14 hour shifts because I don't leave right when I should. And I am seeing these families who are being impacted by COVID. One child, one teacher, one parent intubated in an ICU is too much, is one too many. And I, if we can prevent that, I think we should. And that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Layton. Julie, I just want to say my hand, I don't have a hand raised on my screen, so I just want to make sure I'm on your list. Okay. Thanks. Thank um, I'm sorry. I just, hold on one second. I, I lowered your hand and now I, it was Brayman, the last name. Yeah. <laughs> yep, that's you. You're next. All right. Hi, I'm Julie Brayman. I uh, just want to say I have three kids in the Avondale School District and I am 100% for a mandated mask or mandatory mask mandate. Um, my two stepkids, their mother died of COVID on May 4th and she had Delta and that was, that was in May. So Delta is here and it is blowing up. Um, both of my stepkids had COVID while they were here before we knew that their mom was sick. And both of them were in my daughter's room with her, along with her ABA therapist, with the door closed for over an hour, playing video games. Um, my daughter and her ABA therapist and them had masks on the entire time. We all did here in, in our house. Uh, and neither my daughter or her ABA therapist or my husband or myself uh, got COVID because we had masks on in our house because we have to when ABA is here thankfully. So again, you know, didn't realize that their mom was sick. She died. Now they live here and they go to Avondale. It is very, very important to all of them that masks be mandatory. Uh, Rachel Rich said that kids are missing out on social interactions due to masks. Well, I'm the mother of a special needs student at Avondale, and she was upset today because there were kids in her class that didn't, that had their masks on below their chin. Um, we need masks. So please, please, please make it mandatory because as soon as it, as soon as it mutates and gets worse, Delta is nothing. I mean, wait till Lambda gets here. It's not already. So please vote yes for masks. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Brayman, and thanks for what you're doing for that family. Well, I mean, they're my stuff kids. <laughs> Samantha Schultz. Hi, my name is Lynn Schultz. I couldn't figure out how to change the name. <laughs> um, as a mother of three in the district, babysit two others and have multiple friends with kids in district, all with different health issues and no health issues with some of them. Um, my thoughts on it are, Okay, so we mask them up, we're right, we have less sick kids. We mask them up, we're wrong, what are we really losing? Okay, yeah, kids have masks on. 
why take the chance of him getting sick if we could possibly prevent it? I don't, I don't like masks. My kids don't like the masks, but we wear them for us and for others. And if it makes it safer for them, even in the potential that it's not doing anything, it's not just about us. It's about the entire district, all the parents, all the immunocompromised, all the special needs kids, and all the kids at home that are younger who are now at risk say, I have three kids. What if my fifth grader is exposed to it? She now brings it home, not just to me and my husband, but the two children I babysit, the other two children that I babysit. What now? I have an eight month old or 10 month old child that is now exposed to COVID. What's it gonna hurt to mask? That's just my my two cents there. All right. Thank you, Mrs. Schultz. Um, is it Micheline Kelly? Yes, it is. Okay, go ahead. Hi, I'm Micheline Kelly. Um, I'm not really for or against masks. My concern would be as a school district, are we going to be amping up our security for our children that walk to and from school? I would advise that every parent who has a walking child look up the sex offenders on their streets, in their neighborhoods, because this is a very real possibility that you live in a neighborhood with sex offenders. My point of view on this is that a lot of kids don't even realize that they have the masks on when they're walking home and they wear the mask all the way home. That to me is scary. The kids waiting for the bus, not all parents wait with the bus. That's also scary, just a group of kids sitting out there. And I'm thankful for our bus drivers, but our personal experience with bus drivers, they got dropped off at the wrong bus stop one time and it was on the wrong street. There was young kids. They didn't know what to do and the bus driver left. So those type of things for me personally, make they make me very nervous. So I'm wondering if the school's going to have in place just extra guards, extra parents on the lookout, extra help in general to make sure these kids are getting to and from school safe, safely. All right. Thank you, Ms. Kelly. Mm -hmm. Is it Danmi Singh? Yes, it is. Hi, um, I have two children in ELC at Woodland, and I'm a healthcare provider. And I will tell you, in 18 months, I have seen the worst of worst working in ICU, proning patients, and I've seen everything. I have seen teenagers. I've seen patients in 20s, 30s, 40s, it's not just older people. And I have seen kids who brought COVID to home and their parents actually died. So it, the debate is not about who is pro-mask and who is against mask. This is not the debate is for. The debate is how do we protect our children? How do we protect their health? I understand nobody wants to wear masks. I don't want my kids to wear masks. I want my kids to have all this normal social life that we had, but we are not in the same area. We are dealing with a pandemic and how do we deal with it? We cannot just pretend that COVID didn't happen because we all know there are 37.8 million cases in the United States and that's the science. And there are 6,028,000 uh, deaths in just America. Just in United States, that's the sign. So I really, really give lots of kudos um, to the school board. And I appreciate that you are not trying to make the decision that is not intended for you, meaning you are the educators and that's your job. But what I appreciate you holding today's meeting is protecting my children because I trust you when I send my kids to you because I want you to protect their mental, their physical health and everything. And I appreciate listening to the experts who know what they are talking. They have science behind it. They have 
they have sacrificed all their lives doing it. So that's the right thing to do, to listen to them. Why does school mandate everybody to have vaccines? Why do you ask us for immunization records? So what is wrong in school asking whatever is recommended by American Pediatrician Society and MD, MHDS and uh, CDC? So I really appreciate you guys following those scientists and not just sitting any four people and taking the votes because our kids' life are not dependent on votes. And my response to those parents who are talking about the emotional health would be, you want your children to be alive first. If they are not alive, how are they going to have any kind of emotional health or anything? And children are resilient. They are going to come out stronger out of this. And this is science. And again, this is not just my opinion. This is the science. I'm not just giving my opinion here, but um, it, it, it the, the history has shown. We all know how many people have died out of this. And one kid is too many kids. One parent is too many parents. One teacher is too many lives lost. We don't want that. So I would appreciate and with the ELC um, teachers, I would say um, that you guys have clear masks. Why can't the ELC teachers use the clear mask so kids can um, read their lips and really figure out what they are trying to say? Or you could also use those um, Thank you, Ms. Singh. protective shields. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Martha, please state your full name. There I am. There I am. Hi. There you are. <laughs> Thank you uh, for holding the meeting. I, I as well appreciate it. Um, and my my comments are are brief. I, I know this isn't anything any of us thought we'd be discussing um, at this point in time. I have three children that have gone through, uh, that have been in the Avondale district. I have one left there her senior year. And, you know, look, Avondale's a relatively, or uh, Avondale district is a relatively small community, which makes it very special. I, I've always felt that it's, you know, a real jewel. And we've always been there for our kids. We've shut down, you know, uh, bringing any food with, as the one woman brought up as well, with any peanuts in it to protect one child. And everybody got behind that. We have a, you know, we have our children protected in sports, of course. Even though the injury level is probably very low, we still protect them. We get buzzed in to all the schools. Um, as a, a layer of protection. And I just believe this is another layer of protection that we're providing our children. I believe we as parents and educators and uh, staff and employees, we need to take the lead on this and set the example for the kids and show them again how Avondale comes together and supports each other without without bickering about it and just you know reminding each other of our Avondale community and that's all I have to say thank you thank you very much Steph please state your full name thank you Julie this is Jason Tatamer um, Stephanie and I are the parents of two recent Avondale graduates and a current high schooler. We appreciate, uh, like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Schwartz and the board and all of the staff and uh, administrators in all the buildings and across the district for really uh, doing a great job through this difficult time I know uh, I'll echo the comments of other parents that that's not what you signed up for, but we appreciate everything you've done. And we stand in support of a mask mandate. We believe it's scientifically based. We believe our responsibility, again, as other parents have stated, that it's our responsibility to protect and guide our kids and make them understand or help them understand what community is all about. And Avondale is a is a small district relative to size and 
and we think that that's an advantage and it's opportunities like this to be able to voice our opinion and have it heard is is really very uh, encouraging and is uh, one of the great things about Avondale. Uh, if you're concerned about what might happen, you need only look to the southern states like Texas and Florida. We can see what Delta is doing to those districts down there, hospitals being overrun. And it's just that the scenes and the stories coming out of those areas of the country are horrible. If you're talking about best practices, if you're talking about what's doing, about uh, doing what's right, you need only look to those states to see how to do it wrong. So we need to learn from their mistakes, protect our kids, keep the kids in seat, and do the right thing. Thank you very much for your uh, time tonight, and we uh, support the mask mandate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Denver. Pamela Kay, please state your full name. Hi, Pamela Knapp, K-N-A-P-P. Um, I uh, would uh, like to thank you for taking the time to listen and consider uh, everyone's point of view, and I appreciate everything that you've uh, been done and I've been doing, and I know this isn't an easy decision. Um, I wanted to start with a, a quick uh, story. I have a friend in another state, um, Pennsylvania, uh, Bucks County, near um, CHOP, Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania, Philadelphia. Um, they have a similar rate to us. They're high. She's a doctor, and she reached out to the chief medical officer um, of her hospital to ask what their pediatric surge plan was. And uh, there was an oh shit moment amongst all the executives where they realized that they had really been planning for um, just a regular surge, which normally would involve just moving nurses and equipment from uh, the OR to the COVID unit. Uh, but, you know, this next surge would likely be a pediatric surge, which involves um, background checks and fingerprints and uh, special, you know, sized equipment and special training for um, dealing with pediatrics. Uh, and normally the hospitals in that area, um, which I'm assuming hospitals in our area do the same thing, they refer um, intensive care unit cases for children to the children's hospital. But children's hospitals typically have to run at least 80% capacity to be profitable. And sometimes they're even higher just because of what's going on. They discovered they had 12 available beds in the entire county of 600,000 people uh, for pediatric ICU. Um, and so that, that resulted in you know, the executives, the hospital executives getting with the county health department and putting pressure and they passed a mask mandate. Um, but I would encourage you know, um, anyone uh, you know, I haven't asked our hospitals, but I think that might be something to consider um, looking into. Um, and, you know, just uh, as others have said, few of us here are health experts, and I would ask that the board have the courage to make the call to follow the recommendations of the CDC, APA, and all the other experts. Um, sadly, due to the politics, the decision is passed to you because, you know, there's unlikely to be a, a mandate from higher up, but we all wanna see the kids stay in school. So please take all the steps necessary to ensure that including and especially uh, having a mask mandate, at least um, I think someone said Genesee County Health Department said um, a mask mandate until at least eight weeks after the vaccine is available for the young kids. So um, thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Knapp. Mr. McCord. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yep. Yeah, okay. So, uh, yeah, I'm Gordon McCord. Uh, I am a student here at the high school uh, and have been in uh, Avondale schools for my entire uh, educational career. And as a 100% avid supporter of the mask mandate and for the uh, everything testing and uh, tracking of who has it and who gave it to who. I feel like everybody should just look at the facts and what has been going on everywhere else and what happened last year to make a decision on what we should do this year and in the future. Uh, shoot, I lost my train of thought. <laughs>
Oh, yeah. Okay. So, uh, I, if we do not have a mask mandate, I do not feel comfortable going to school here in the uh, Avondale schools anymore, even though it is my uh, family, I feel like. Uh, as my dad has agreed with, I will be doing the like online stuff as uh, Mr. McDougall, I think, said earlier. Uh, I just uh, feel pretty saddened that people would rather uh, go with selfish thoughts in mind for not wearing masks than just for the uh, health and safety of everybody else and everybody around them. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. McDougall. Alex Ramirez. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for the opportunity to address the board. I have uh, two children in the Avondale School District now, and I hope that you take the recommendations presented by Dr. Schwartz and approve a mask mandate to keep our children safe. Um, you've heard all the reasons why it is vital to keep our children in school and in person and you know, strongly believe that masking can help maintain that, but masking only works when everybody does it. Um, I don't have any anything further to provide that hasn't already been eloquently presented and discussed other than to extend my full support of a mask mandate. Thank you for the hard decisions you have to make. Thank you. And thank you for taking time tonight, Mr. Ramirez. Okay, listed as CCMCL, please state your full name. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. There we go. Um, so yeah, my name is Christopher McLaughlin. I have uh, two students that are in the district. Um, one's in high school, one's in middle school, and uh, they are the best students in the district. Um, how can I say that? Well, um, I'm not in full possession of all the facts. I don't have a lot of evidence uh, that they are the best students in the district, but you know, I know them and they're perfect little angels. So uh, I, uh, it, that kind of brings me to what I wanna talk about. And that is a lot of the uh, errors in reasoning that I'm hearing tonight. Um, a lot of the, the folks that are trying to make a point are presenting um, non-evidenced reasons why they want a certain outcome. And uh, I'm hearing a lot of things like non sequiturs, right? Where the people are making conclusions that don't follow from the premises. Um, I'm hearing uh, um, sort of a, a lot of false starts, a lot of straw man reasoning. For example, I, I keep hearing from people who oppose um, stopping the spread of the virus through using masks, uh, saying things like um, that, that uh, there's very little chance that kids are going to catch COVID and get sick from it. Um, nobody's disagreeing with that. What we, what we really want is we want to avoid a small outbreak. We want to avoid a big outbreak, but we want to avoid a small outbreak too. Um, I, uh, I'm just, uh, I, I support the, the um, using masks in conjunction with other preventative measures, because from uh, what I've read from what of, what experts have provided, it's, it's that um, using a, a combination of uh, preventative measures are really the best way to prevent infection from spreading through our schools. Um, that some people have called it the Swiss cheese method, right? Where you get slices of Swiss cheese that represent the individual preventative methods and then you have uh, you know, COVID, which is trying to get through the holes. And each method, like for example, masking, will prevent a certain amount of infection from spreading, but some of it will get through. And then you have the next level of testing, for example. Um, we should have daily uh, um, uh, uh, checks, right? When kids walk in the school, 
uh, with a little digital thermometer to check to make sure that nobody has a high temperature. We should have tracking. Uh, and, and all of these things, all of these slices of Swiss cheese, if you layer them together, it will dramatically reduce the transmission and spread of this disease. Um, I'd like to hear, uh, you know, there's this false equivalence. That Thank you, I'm Mr. Hearing. McLaughlin. I'm sorry, Thank your you. time's up. Yep. Elizabeth Lowe. Hello, um, I am a date art and drama teacher. Um, and I will say it is difficult to teach drama and teach facial expressions with masks. However, that being said, I would rather wear a mask any day than ever go back to remote because that was darn near impossible. And if putting on a fabric mask and asking our students to wear a fabric mask or a disposable mask means that we get to keep those kids in the classroom and get to keep them engaged in front of us. I can sit there and make crazy messes in my art. I can have those kids up on the stage being as crazy as possible. Then I'm all for it. And I so appreciate that the board has brought this forward and they've let the community talk and we've heard both sides of the issue. Um, and I am putting my trust and my faith in the board and our superintendent because you have not steered us wrong yet. So I know as a teacher, I will support anything you guys say, but I do hope that you fully consider the mandate for the masks. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lowe. Okay, listed as the booths, please state your full name. Hi, my name is Nathan Booth, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, you know, I, I would just say, First, that I also, I, I deeply appreciate the board. Uh, I've been, uh, I've served before in, in various capacities and, and I appreciate your desire to ensure the, the continuity of, of safe education. And, and uh, I'm also thankful for alternatives that are offered for learning, uh, regardless of, of, of uh, how effective they may or may not be for certain individuals. Uh, I, I, what I, I really want to, uh, to to voice regarding this mask mandate decision. Okay, is is that um, well, well? One just to get it out of the way. I don't. I don't really. Uh, yeah, I'm not a big fan of, of masks for a lot of different reasons, uh, but mainly because uh, you know when we do this, we we do it halfway. We're, we're really false about it, and 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 I can't. I cannot absorb that. My father died from the vaccine. That was the autopsy result. That was the doctor's opinion, okay? So when we say one is too many, I agree. One is too many. And, and, and we never heard that before COVID, right? We're not talking about the fact that COVID can infect animals and it can mutate and, and we're, never, we're not immunizing our dogs, okay? So, so let's, let's be real about this. If one is too many, okay? then the masks need to be provided by the district and they need to be real masks. They cannot be fake masks. There, there is so much scientific evidence. You wanna talk about evidence about which masks work most effectively and which ones don't. Let's, let's, let's make, make it right then. Uh, let's talk about the distancing. Let's talk about this, this uh, idea of vaccination. Well, if one is too many, and there's one person that dies from the vaccine, then we've already contradicted ourselves, right? So, so let's be careful about when, when we have these, these conversations, let's keep the, 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 the motives pure, like I think they are. I think that the motives are to keep our kids safe and to keep them in school, and I appreciate that. And, and let's try to think about the ways to do it, though, to implement it in such a way that it really is going to be effective, and it really does follow the science and, 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 and let's keep, like some people said, the, the politics and things out of it, okay? And, and, um, and, and try to do what's right for everybody. And that starts with kids not being sent to school when they're sick even, right? We're not using school as a daycare. And, and, and we, 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 we just need to do the common sense things to keep everyone safe. And if it's masks and we can do that, I don't like it, but okay, we'll do it, right? 
that's that's just my opinion at least thank you for your time uh, thank you, Mr. Booth, and our condolences to your father. Dana Greer. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I guess my statement would be I'm a I'm a I'm special ed um medical para in the district. I have two things. One, I would like all the parents to remember. Back in the day when you were younger or when your parents were younger, when we had to be vaccine, it was not an option. It was an uproar back then. It seems to be an uproar now. Number two, you have to realize this is something new. This is a pandemic. It's not something we're used to. We have to keep cool heads and a calm heart. We want to attack everybody. We want to say that is this or that or whatever. It's not. If we look at what's really going on, I don't particularly like wearing a mask, but I have to. I'm fine with it. I know some people have a hard time breathing with a mask. I get that as well. But we need to remember, now that Pfizer is officially FDA approved, it's not an emergency. We may be going back to what we have to do when our kids started school. We all had to show our kids were vaccine, vaccinated before they started school. This is going to be something that jobs are going to be requiring so either we get on board or we're going to be left behind when we get left behind that might be tragedy we don't want to do this my mother died of COVID last year it's not a pretty picture and it's not a good death it's a slow painful strangulation and when they say it sucks the life out of you it really does I just want us to think about who are we fussing why are we yelling at one another why can't we just say Okay, if we're going to do a mask mandate, I do agree with the people who spoke before. If we're going to do it, let's not do it haphazard. Either it's all or nothing. I understand some parents may not, their children may not be able to be masked, but let's protect them as well. However, that can go down. But this infighting has got to stop. We've got enough, we got more important things to worry about than whether or not we get along because this world is crazy enough as it is. We just need to take a step back, think about who we're trying to protect and let's move forward that way. That's all I have to say. And thank you. Thank you, Ms. Greer. And off uh, our condolences to your family as well. Thank you. Tammy Schroeder. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Um, Board of Education, and um, I am a mother of three of my grown children have gone through the Avondale District, and they are very successful. We have appreciated our Avondale experiences, and uh, my children have all had great experiences in the small community that we also call home. Um, my youngest is in 10th grade at the high school this year. Um, to Dana, Julie, and the Booth family, I, I want to um, concur with Mr. Lang and, and express my sincere sympathies for your losses this year, my heart grieves for your families. And Corin, it's good to see you. You've grown up with Nicole and it's good to see you here. Um, all right, I would like to just speak for a few minutes on what I, some of the things I've heard tonight. I know we were asked to not debate the uh, efficacy of masks. However, this in the entire presentation we were presented with today assume as a presupposition that masks work. Um, Mr. Lang, I was very grateful to hear that you have read all of our emails because I did send the entire school board members an email with regard to um, the science and the, the, um, the research that's been done regarding masks and um, how they do not work. So I'm, I'm grateful that you have read that. I appreciate that. I was wanted to ask that, so thank you. Um, masks are not a neutral topic. It's not the same as peanut butter in schools. It's not the same as seatbelts. Masks in and of themselves are, it, it's a medical, it's a medical process. Um, I, I heard tonight that, uh, you know, being it's selfish to not wear a mask or it's selfish to choose not to wear a mask in a community. However, I don't, I don't understand how it is selfish to put one's health to consider one's health because this is a medical decision, um, and and choosing not wear, to not wear a mask isn't a, ma a matter of oh I don't want to I don't want to not bring peanut I want to have a peanut butter jelly sandwich in school it happens to be a medical decision. There was a group of parents in Florida I heard Florida mentioned who took all of their children's masks and had them sent to a lab 
And what they found was that they were full of pathogens, pneumonia, tuberculosis, meningitis, sepsis, food poisoning, uh, Lyme's disease, um, beginnings of uh, resistance to antibiotics uh, and many high morbi morbidity infections. So masks create problems. They are medical risk. Um, anyway, so th that's, that's an issue that I think we need to consider. Um, children are not super spreaders. That's also been proven. And, um, and I think that if, if, but if there's all that, okay, no time to get into everything in depth. However, and I think we need to ask ourselves better questions as a district. Why are these rates just being escalated right now before school starts? I think we just need to ask ourselves some of these questions. However, but the question before us is what can we do as a community? I care about our community. I don't disagree with people who have different opinions from me. I think we all have the freedom to have our own opinions. That is just our, our right under the constitution. However, if the question before us is what to do as a community, I, I maintain that we main, that we keep what we've already decided, which I applauded a few weeks ago, is that we have a, a, a choice. And the choice isn't just a haphazard choice. The choice is about our own, making decisions for our own medical, medical health, which until recently was considered private. Um, and I, and in my, my, my perspective would be that if there are families who feel that their children are, have higher vulnerability, then my suggestion would be it, that it would be prudent to develop measures that allow them to protect themselves. And I agree, not N95s or something that actually physically may, may help them, rather than continue to sacrifice the well being of our children. While there is no excess mortality among children in any state, if there, there are parents who feel their children are at greater risk, developing tailored mitigation strategies to support them would be more prudent, particularly given that it's been proven that mask mandates have no impact on in-school transmission. But there are very visible and social invasive measures that come along with mandating masks. Um, and then we haven't even talked about the mental health issues that come with masks with, with higher suicide rates and the things that, COVID is curable and there's the hospital protocol and there's other protocols. I've seen many people this year cured from COVID from following non-hospital protocols. So there's, it's, it's a high effect, it's a high, rate, it's a high um, recovery rate and we're treating it like it isn't. And that's a problem in our communities as well. People have choices when they make medical decisions and the results follow those choices sometimes. Um, Thank you, Ms. Schrader. Thank you for the time, I appreciate it. Yep, thank you. Um, fellow board members, we still have a number of people that would like to speak here as well as our own board debate tonight. I would like to make a motion for a 10 minute recess, uh, quick bio break here and uh, for our audience as well as us. Uh, do I have a second for that? Sure, I'll second it. I'll second. <laughs> Seconded by Mr. Tischer. All in favor, please voice vote by saying aye. 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 All opposed, nay. All right. Uh, for our audience, we will be back in session then at, uh, by my count, 820 then. Thank you all.
All right. For our audience benefit, if you just joined us, we just came off a brief 10 minute recess here. Uh, I know we still have a number of people that would like to speak this evening. As a reminder, if you would like to address the board, I know we have several people that are still in line, uh, but those that would like to join that line, uh, if you click on your reactions button at the bottom of your Zoom window, there is a raise hand button that will signify that uh, you would like to address the board tonight. That'll put you in line for uh, Julie to go through our list. And with that, Julie, I'll let you uh, continue at the top there. Andrew Weedock. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. I, I would like to state that I fully support a mask mandate and comprehensive COVID mitigation program. You can debate the level of efficacy of masks, but the facts are that just since August 12th, over 200,000 K-12 students have tested positive for COVID in Florida. 21 schools have had to fully close already. The current recommendations from the CDC and American Academy of Pediatrics and many non-political scientific bodies are strongly recommending a mask mandate for K-12. It's the best tool we have for those that aren't vaccinated. The overwhelming majority of doctors that we trust for our children's health care in every other matter are recommending masking. We need to trust them in this matter as well. Science is not, a static, is not static. The scientific method prescribes a process for continuing to study and enhance our understanding of a given subject. Policy should be revised based on those new observations and learnings. The new models, based on the latest science, support the need for mask mandates. Regardless of previous policy or prior knowledge, please make your decisions based on the latest, best science. Please continue to follow the science and continue to update your approach as new science and, uh, scientific information becomes available. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weedock. Zena Ferranzo. Hello. Hi. 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 So um, I'd like to thank you all for doing this tonight. Um, I do want to start off by saying uh, today I did drop off. I, I'm sorry. I have two in Auburn Elementary, um, a second grader and a fourth grader. And then I have a four-year-old whose birthday is today that will be starting there next month. Um, the kids did ask me, do we have to wear masks? I said, it's not mandatory. Um, they might make you, but it's not mandatory. So my oldest said, so we don't have to, right? I said, um, it's not mandatory. They walked in, came home, barged in and said, mom, they made us wear masks. I said, did you ask if it was mandatory? She said, yes. And they said, no. And they said, you still have to wear it. They were complaining. They were up, very upset and they're like I, we don't want to do this this year I, I just thought about my four-year-old going in next month and I just can't I can't imagine her wearing a mask she never liked it she even when we when it was mandated a state mandate she I had to leave certain places because she would not wear it um, I think it should be up to us I think it should be if it's not mandated by CDC, state mandate, everywhere, grocery stores, everywhere, I think the school should, the families and staff should have their own choice on this subject. Um, I understand there's a lot of people that have been lost. I understand that there are a lot of people who are um, compromised. I, I have my own mother who's had MS for 26 years. So I, I get it. Um, I just think in the school, it should be up to the families and up to the staff. For those who want to wear it, go ahead. For those who don't, go ahead. That's all I have to say today. And thank you, Ms. Ferranzo. Thank you. Jason, I'm sorry, I'm Urquhart. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, it's Jason Urquhart. Uh, First off, I'd like to say uh, thank you to the board for uh, letting us all uh, have an opportunity to speak to you. I know this is, uh, you know, a very hard uh, decision for you guys. And I'd like to take some of that burden off you guys. And I'd just like to say that I'd like to see it in the uh, choice of the, of the parents. Let us take the burden of this. You don't have to. And uh, I just think I think it should be up to the uh, parents to make medical decisions for their children. 
And, and that's what I'd like to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carr. Shares iPhone, please state your full name. I didn't want to get to it. Are you there, Cher? I'm sorry. Which share? It was share. It said shares the iPhone. Sh Shannon, I think no. I'm. No, okay. No, no. Okay, I apologize. I apologize. Yeah, it was shares. C H E R shares iPhone. All right, Julie, if you want to move okay. on, if, if they indicate again, we can bump them up the list. Okay. Uh, next is Ashley. Please state your full name. Hello. Hello. <laughs> uh, my name is Ashley Crowley. Um, if my name sounds familiar, it's probably because you've all received a few emails from me over the last couple of weeks. Uh, and if you recall those emails, then you know my husband and I strongly support a mask mandate based on the science and data and what we're seeing in other states in regards to the Delta variant. Uh, tonight, I wanted to reemphasize our position from a different perspective. Our daughter who is attending ELC this year was born with a medical condition. Within moments of her birth, the doctor said two sentences that no parent ever wants to hear. We have to take your daughter to the ICU. She isn't breathing on her own. Uh, the first time I saw her 12 hours later, she was in an oxygen tent. I couldn't even see her face due to the fogging in the tent. Um, because of her fragility and inability to breathe, I wasn't able to hold her for the first time until she was two days old. Uh, it took 11 days for the doctors to figure out what her condition was, 11 days of watching her sleep and little else, of not being able to comfort her as she screamed when the nurses had to dig into her arm, her foot, and ultimately her scalp to find a vein that could take an IV. Uh, panicking every time the alarms went off because her oxygen dipped too low, 11 days parked next to her bassinet um, and having doctors shrug their shoulders and tell us that they are doing all they can. I tell this story because now she's a happy, healthy three-year-old, thank goodness. Uh, and yet again, uh, here we are facing the possibility of hearing the words, your daughter needs to go to the ICU. She can't breathe on her own. Uh, and as you can all imagine, that idea terrifies us. We can say that kids aren't as affected by COVID, but we know that isn't true with the Delta variant. And I can tell you that um, sorry, a little emotional. You never ever want to be in a situation like we were with a seriously ill child. Um, it's a hell that I wouldn't wish on anyone. And frankly, the idea that anyone in this meeting or in this community wouldn't do anything and everything they could to prevent that is shocking and baffling to me. For those saying masks will impede their child having a positive experience at school, our son was virtual for kindergarten all of last year. So today was his first in-person school day since pre-K. He and his sister wore their masks with no issue all day today. And the first thing he said to me when I picked him up today was, Mom, I never want to leave there. So uh, thank you to Mrs. Von Allman for giving him a great first day. Um, I thank you board members for reading my emails to those of you who responded and for your time today. I'd like to reiterate what I mentioned in one of my emails that if we are at a higher risk now than we were this time last year, if it wasn't safe then, it isn't safe now. I ask again that you please vote to mandate masks for pre-K through 12th grade. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Crowley. Yep, Cher's iPhone is back there, Julie. Yep, let's try Cher's iPhone again. Are you there? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Could you state your full name, please? Yeah, I had technical difficulties. This is Cherie Daniel. The only thing I want to state, mask or no masks, it's whatever you decide, and it sounds like you've already decided. The only thing I, that I want to bring to the board's attention is that I think everything should be left to the parents. I think they know what's best for their children. I think the agencies did recommendations. They have the power to do mandates. They didn't mandate masks. It's here nor there, my daughter had COVID, okay? So I'm not, she has some type of immunity as it is. But the thing I wanna to bring to your attention is how many students have to leave the district because you take away the parents right to decide what's best for the child. We lost 30 kids last year. How many more decisions do you make 
that's going to influence more parents moving their children out of the district. Can you afford to lose all that money? It's all about money. Clearly. How many more have to leave? There are more students that are going to leave every time you take away the parent's decision. What's best for the child? You put us online. You brought us back for a few weeks. Now you're like, oh, we're going to wear masks. We're not going to wear masks. It's here nor there. It hasn't been mandated. The state has the power to mandate it. They have not. They recommend. And now you're deciding for the parents. What happened to the parents deciding what's best for the child? I don't care if you do masks or no masks. Like I said, my child had COVID. I'm just telling you to tread lightly. There'll be no students left at this district. How much money can you afford to lose? Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Daniel. Surreal Patel. Hi. Uh, once, uh, once again, once like everyone else, I'd like to thank the board for uh, the opportunity. I hope I can be heard okay. Um, yes. I'd like to state that uh, both my wife and I are um, in the healthcare field. Um, I work a lot extensively with epidemiologists as well, uh, specifically on COVID related matters. But more interesting is probably my wife's role, who is a pediatrician in Bloomfield Hills. Uh, lately, she has been seeing children, again, children testing positive. Uh, I think it's important to state that within I, my own family, as a result of that, she's not hugging our own daughter, who's a second grader um, at Avondale. We're often sleeping in separate rooms, depending through this pandemic. Again, because we, and, and some would say that this is perhaps overkill. You can't, you can't it's not overkill. We again have colleagues and extended family also in the medical field who has been infected and who has paid the price. So, you know, from what I'm looking at is that there's tremendous data and I don't know what fringe studies others may be referencing, but as credible as it gets right here locally, Beaumont Health supports mask mandates. They want, and this is local, most of us here if we get sick, we get a heart attack, we trust the judgment of Beaumont Health. Um, and it's the same scientific method, the same scientific processes that have determined that this is the right course of action for the schools in this area. At a state level, I understand it's a little bit different because they're looking at a larger area, but based on the density of the population here, this is the advice of Beaumont Health, as well as obviously the other institutions that have been mentioned. I myself have ordered N95 masks for my uh, daughter and you know they're they're fairly cheap so I mean I do encourage it but children do spread the virus um, we have plenty of data to prove that and so um, I'd also mention that I understand that one of the arguments is medical choice but I don't think this is a medical choice situation and I and honestly the track record of those embracing safety precautions historically isn't that great. I mean, in 1985, no one wanted to wear a seatbelt. It was like very low approval rating. Today, we all wear seatbelts. I grew up without sitting in a car seat. Today, all our kids are in car seats, right? So there's been opposition from parents on a lot of safety matters. But, you know, I think that we in the field of science, you know, we'd like to weigh in here. <laughs> I think this is honestly the best choice. Uh, for our kids, given where we are at. And if things change, you know, by all means, uh, I'm all for that. But some children, especially mine, are, are not in an age range that is eligible for a vaccine. So thank you for taking that into consideration. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Mr. Patel. James McCann. Good evening. Uh, I'm, I'm James. Uh, I just want to voice my opinion in regards to the mask mandate. My wife and I uh, fully support the mask mandate and really appreciate the members of the board acknowledging that there is going to be tension in this matter and still op opening the floor to us to uh, students here, so parents of students. I currently have a son who just began his first day of school today. And uh, earlier, a parent had mentioned how 
their student came home and said that they were ecstatic that they saw everyone at school and they never want to leave. Uh, my son was in the exact same boat and actually heard this board meeting going on and someone mentioned the word masks. And he said, Daddy, can I go get a Spider-Man mask? I think that this is an op excellent opportunity for teachers and administrators to let kids flourish in their own way and express their own excitement in this manner. Um, I am currently, I am an active duty soldier who is recruiting out of the Oakland County and Warren, as well as Wayne County area. Um, and I will say that in regards to cases and people coming positive with COVID, uh, I'm not a medical professional and therefore I'm not going to voice a medical opinion. I will voice a completely emotional opinion. And it is horrible um, seeing a parent having to say goodbye to their kids and not being allowed in the same room as them as they gasp for breath and not being allowed to say anything other than it's going to be okay, and hoping they're hearing them through all the doctors, through all the, the, the medical procedures being performed. And to that, I really do have to say, I appreciate all our medical professionals as well as educational professionals. Um, please continue to enable parents to make their kids wear masks. Please, please make this happen as this is the only way for us to continue our safety for our own son. Um, every single day when he comes home from school, he will be getting a bath. He will be getting fully cleaned and changed as well as his sister. Um, that, that's really all my wife and I have to say. Uh, thank you for what you do and I hope you guys have a great night. And thank you for your service, Mr. McCann. Ian Dewsbury. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir. My name is Ian. Uh, I'm, my family is new to the district. My son started kindergarten today. My daughter started second grade. Um, the first thing I wanna say is thank you to the student who spoke earlier. I think what you did was brave and commendable and I appreciate that. Uh, I also wanna say thank you to the board for having this conversation. Um, I thought the board members asked a lot of really insightful questions and it helped me understand some of the um, details of the issue that I maybe didn't appreciate earlier. Um, so I, I, I'm glad there's a lot of thought being put into these decisions. That's commendable as well. Um, I also wanna thank Dr. Schwartz for his emphasis on community. Um, Cause I think that's really, for me, just emotionally at the heart of this whole matter. Um, as a parent, modeling is so important. You have to show your kids how you want them to behave in the world. Um, so I think we need to show the kids that they live in a community that's strong enough to put up with some temporary inconveniences. If it means preventing a shutdown, if it means preventing quarantines, if it means preventing uh, hospitalization or death of members of our community, I think we should be strong enough to put up with a little inconvenience. So obviously I'm strongly in favor of a mask mandate. Um, I want to finish with a question. And as I said, I'm, I'm new to the district. So if, if there's been a lot of discussion on this earlier, I apologize. Um, looking at the charts from earlier in the presentation, obviously mask mandates brings everybody's risks down by quite a bit. It looks like, especially at the elementary level, testing would reduce the risk by half again. So I'm wondering what, at what point we could start talking about, talking about adding testing to a masking regimen. Thanks very much for allowing me to speak tonight. Thank you, Mr. Dewsbury, and welcome to the Evandale family. Um, if you'd like some follow-up on that question, I would encourage you to reach out to their administration offices um, during the school day, and I'm sure they'd be happy to talk with you about, uh, you know, uh, testing protocols, things of that nature, as far as uh, where we stand on that. Kim F., please state your full name. Hi, my name is Kim Fugate. I'm a district parent of three boys in three different schools in the Avondale community. I am a registered nurse. I work in an emergency department and I just got off of a 12 hour shift today. My COVID numbers are increasing, mostly in adults is what I've been seeing. If a child is hospitalized with COVID, um, there's only one parent allowed into the building. As soon as you enter my building, there's a mask mandate to keep me safe and to keep um, you from spreading any other germs. 
I do think that masks are important. That's one layer of what we can do to help keep our kids safe. Um, I would like to also encourage um, hand washing, sanitization breaks, also cleaning of the desks in common areas and asking parents to come in and do that would be amazing. COVID is survivable. survivable. We've proved that. That's not an issue. The after effects of COVID, the blood clots, the strokes, the atrial fibrillation that I've been seeing in very young people in their 20s and 30s is dramatically increasing. So yes, COVID survivable. Well, what about the after effects? If your child gets COVID and he survives, but brings it into the house, and the parent has to lose paychecks um, and work time, I think that we should definitely consider increasing all levels of sanitization and wearing masks because nurses are tired. There's not going to be enough nurses to take care of what's happening. And we all know that the first two weeks of school, when kids go back, everybody gets sick because it's just mixing of, of germs. But this time, this might be a, a, a different a different outcome. So I am in support of this and I, I very much appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fugate. Hi, you're listed under Julie Bramman, but I think it's her son. Uh, yeah, Hi. I'm, I'm her stepson. She spoke earlier and I wanted to say something. Okay. Um, the flu season for 2021 and last year, 2020, um, was almost non-existent once they started to get stricter with the mask mandates. And so if that's not proof enough that we should be wearing masks, then I really don't know what is. And I just wanted to say that and get that out there. All right. Thank you, Mr. Brayman. Appreciate you weighing in. Uh, Bonnie Bedford, Benford. Hi, I'm actually Bonnie's mom, Brandy Benford. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, I'm just making it short and sweet. I am not in favor of a mask mandate. I feel that it should be left up to the parents. Um, I'm not, I don't feel that they work. And I think that if you are scared and want your child to wear a mask, then that's your choice. But it should be up to the parent as well as the child to make that decision for themselves. And to the flu comment that was just made, um, the PCR testing do not differentiate between COVID and the flu. And so saying that those are, there are zero flus is completely inaccurate. So I just wanted to put that out there. Again, completely against a mask mandate. It should be my decision, not yours. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Benford. Leah Kello. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi, I am the mom of a kindergartner um, and I am the mom of a child who suffered from COVID at the age of four. And I wanna tell the parents out there who have not experienced this, that it is one of the most scary things that I've ever been through. And to you parents who don't think your child needs to wear a mask, I pray, I pray you never have to go through that. It was horrible. Um, and I just wanna say that I think we need to bring this back to what the superintendent said at the beginning. This is not about us. This is about our children. This is about preventing them from having a second year of learning from home. That is so hard on their mental health. I've had a son home almost 18 months and he has suffered immensely because one, I have to do my job every day. My husband has to do his job every day and our poor son, is home. Yeah, he gets to talk to his grandparents and stuff on the phone, but he does not get to exp experience interacting with other kids. Guess what? He gets to interact with those kids when he's wearing a mask. And if that's what it takes, then that's what we need to do. We need to prevent going back to learning from home where they're just looking at their, their friends on a screen. That's what's important here. It's not about us. It's about our children. And to the school board, thank you. Thank you for having this meeting. Thank you for seriously thinking about it and for letting us have the chance to speak. Thank you, Ms. Kello, appreciate that. Billy Chafin. Are you there, Billy? 
Yeah, sorry. There I just want to say that um, I am very against the mask. My son has played travel baseball through the whole summer. Last year, his mental state went down so bad that he discussed suicide because he could not leave the house. He couldn't do anything. He hasn't worn a mask the entire time. His immune system is amazing. We want to talk about the science. Let's talk about building their immune systems. You mask them, they have weak immunities. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of sick kids who have been masked and who do not have the immune system that the kids who are not masked have. We have to follow that science also. Trust in their immunities, make sure they're washing their hands, and do not mask our children. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chafin. Samantha, Samantha Javier. Yes, Samantha Javier. Um, hi, my name is Samantha Javier. I have a daughter currently in first grade at Deerfield. I have a teaching degree in elementary in both special education. I come from a family, many public ed school educators. Therefore, I'm very familiar with what kids need in order to get a proper education. I'm speaking today in favor of keeping masks optional. There should definitely not be a mask mandate. There is currently no mask mandate given by the Oakland County Health Department as was stated by our school district that it would not be mandated unless there was. Parents are fully capable of making a health decision based on what's best for their child without the school officials input. That's why optional is the best for all families. It leaves the decision up to the fa ind individual family. If you want your child to wear a mask to school, then send them with one. There's really no problem with it. If you don't, then we don't need to. I also have a speech therapist in my family, so I'm educated on how mass affects a child's ability for speech and articulation. Since my daughter's in first grade, she's going to be learning how to read. I'm very concerned. A mass can jeopardize her full ability to learn to read properly. She cannot read any facial expressions from her teacher as her teacher can't read hers. Please cover your mouth. Say the short E sound. Now say the short I sound. They both sound the same under a mask. So if sounds and words can sound the same under a mask, how do you expect my child to get a proper education when school, when she's learning how to read? Her kindergarten year was already disrupted as it was for many students. She can't afford to have another school year where her learning will be impeded by mass. So my question to you is what criteria are you guys looking for when children no longer need to wear a mask anymore? These children have been playing all summer long with other children, both indoors and outdoors. Some have also gone to summer school all summer, no mask. And now as, as soon as school starts on the night of the first day of school, you want children to mask up again? All I'm asking is for the opportunity for families to make their own decisions for their own children regarding masks and not leave it up to you guys. Thanks, have a great night. Thank you, Ms. Javier. Elizabeth's iPhone, please state your full name. Elizabeth. All right, we're going to go to Savannah Brooks. Hi, my name is Savannah Brooks. I'm a parent of two students that attend Avondale schools. Um, one of which is a third or a fourth grader now, and the other one is in pre-K, um, neither of which are eligible to be vaccinated at this point. Um, there's no valid scientific research that says wearing a mask is causing more harm than good. Working in a hospital, we have staff that regularly wear masks every day of their career. They've been wearing masks long before the pandemic, and they've had no adverse effects. Um, I think if there was adverse effects, they wouldn't enforce healthcare providers wearing them in surgical procedures. Um, gambling and risking our children's health directly or by secondary exposure is unnecessary until we at the very least have an option of getting our children vaccinated. Our teachers have gone above and beyond to educate our kids this past year. We owe them the extra bit of safety requiring masks at this time, just as we do with building security protocols, fire drills, background checks, et cetera, every other thing that we do for the safety of our children and our educators. If you don't want to vac vaccinate or wear a mask, you have the choice of seeking education in person or remote. 
at other school districts or private facilities, but we don't have the choice to vaccinate our kids under 12. It's just not an option at this time. It should be our due diligence to listen to healthcare professionals that have done the research necessary and protect those that cannot protect themselves, whether they're not of age or can't get a vaccine for health reasons. I've been seeing news reports from areas in the southern part of the U.S. that have already started school. They have high positivity rates, high pediatric admission rates, and they're already switching to virtual or remote learning. We all, we did this last year trying to debate whether we should be in person or remote. We don't want to go remote again. None of us do. So this is just a small ask to keep us on track and keep us in person. I fully support a mask mandate for our under 12 student population and going forward for the unvaccinated population once we do um, have it available for the under 12 students. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brooks. Kendra McKenzie. Hi, um, I am a mother of two um, would-be Deerfield Elementary students. Um, we actually pulled our kindergartner because there was not a mask mandate and she'll be attending the private school where I work um, this year. And our son is currently virtual because he has an autoimmune uh, disorder and we just don't feel comfortable sending him to school with unmasked kids until he can be vaccinated or until um, rates are really low. Uh, and we'd really love to see him back in person. We'd really love a mask mandate. It's not about individuals or what's good for for just one kids, it is really what you have all said. This is about community and I'm not a scientist. So I'm not gonna quote articles and tell you things. You're wonderful people who have done lots of research. Um, uh, I am also like someone earlier stated, I'm a teacher. Uh, I have a master's in special ed and a master's in early childhood ed. And I taught at a school where we mandate masks and we mandated them all year last year. And we were in person all year last year with only a couple of times that we were home on virtual um, and we kept our kids safe and we had very low instances of any COVID cases. Um, and that was just my personal experience. And I'm not gonna say anything about science except that our family absolutely believes in masks. We hope that you will make this decision so that our son can go to second grade in person because he would really, really love that. Thank you, Ms. McKenzie. Is it Shaylin? Yes, great pronunciation. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, so Shaylin Bat, I am the father of a uh, second grader at Gate and a first grader at Deerfield. And first, you know, I've I've been in public service before, and so I just want to thank all the members of the school board. This is hard, and I'm sure when you signed up to do this, this was certainly not the level of vitriol and, and passion that I'm sure that you were expecting. So thank you um, for your time, consideration and care. And I know it's a tough decision. Uh, I would just say that um, I've been listening to a lot of the, the comments and it, this is a hard uh, choice. I mean, I hate wearing a mask. Um, if, I, if I didn't have to, I, I, I wouldn't wear one. Um, our daughters have had challenges with wearing the masks. But at the end of the day, where I fall back to is what do the experts say? And the preponderance of experts, CDC, American Society of Pediatrics, Duke University, John Hopkins Medical Society, all recommend wearing masks uh, for the unvaccinated. And, um, you know, I think that all of us thought we were through this, you know, the summer we got vaccinated. Now Delta variant has changed the calculus a little bit. And so I would say that my, my hope would be that you would vote to require masks until such time, probably uh, towards the end of this year, early next year, when vaccines are available for kids ages five uh, to 12. Because at that point, for all the parents who are like, let us make a choice, then for the parents for whom it's not about choice is we would have a vaccinated child in close contact with unmasked children, as opposed to just the mask. Uh, you know, protecting those children who choose. And so I know it's tough and I know it's hard, but I, I would fully support uh, a continuation of the mask mandate and just appreciate your efforts. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Bitt. Appreciate that. We're going to try Elizabeth's iPhone again. Elizabeth, are you there? 
Yes, I'm here. I'm sorry. There okay. we go. What's your full I'm name? Used, I'm, I'm not used to Zoom. Yeah. My name's Elizabeth Williams. Um, I'm a life. I'm a lifelong resident within the district. I'm actually class of '98. I have a four-year-old who is a preschooler at Woodland Elementary. Today was the first day. Um, I'm nervous, so I'm sorry. I'm sure the decision you made Thursday was a tough decision, and I'm sure you. You are being pulled from all sides of this matter. I would never want to be in your position, but here we are, 17 months later. Here we are, 17 months after the two weeks to slow the spread. I am not anti-mask, I'm not anti-vax, but I am pro-freedom of choice. I believe that schools have no right to meddle in the decisions pertaining to children's health. I also do not agree that other parents should have the right to tell me that I should mask my son, who happens to be at the lowest risk of con contracting COVID-19. I have never masked him in the 17 months since the pandemic began, except for doctor's appointments. <clears throat> I'm also a respiratory therapist who have worked during the COVID and seen these patients. I know my son has a strong immune system. I never kept him sheltered and I never stopped him from being a kid. I will not allow my child to live in fear over a virus with a 99.9% .9 recovery rate. Today, my son brought home his mask. It was dirty. It was filled with boogers, food, and snot after four hours. How, how can I be fine with this? I'm, I'm sure other parents are fine with their kids coming home with dirty masks filled with boogers and who knows what else, but I am not, and so are many others. I'm in healthcare. I work during this whole period with COVID patients. I am at bedside with these patients gowned up with an N95 and goggles, double masked. I can tell you the majority of these patients have a full recovery. We had more people recover, recover than die. My hospital is overcrowded, not because of COVID, but because we don't have any staff. As of yesterday, we had eight units closed. I am in downtown Detroit. I will not give the hospital name. We have no staff. Two of those units are closed, our ICU. Because we have no staff, we have, we are actually, should have 500 beds. We, we currently have over, we have currently have 250 beds that are utilized. Nurses are not leaving because of burnout. They're leaving because there's more money to be made in the Southern border. That's where they're going to. They're going to Texas, they're going to Florida. They're going to California. We currently have 10 COVID positives with five being in the ICU. I don't see the surge. I don't see Delta. We're not seeing Delta where I am. So I don't know where this is coming from. All of my information that I have found is on CDC website and the Michigan.gov website. There are currently one pediatric, two, two or three in Oakland County pediatric patients that are actually COVID positive and they're not in the ICU. Thank you, Ms. There Williams. Zero, there have been zero deaths in the state of Michigan for pediatric patients. How is this? How are you even considering a mask mandate? I don't want my son. Ms. Williams, masked. I'm sorry, your time's expired. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Emily Jarima. Hi, I'm a teacher at the high school. I just wanted to say that our goal from the beginning of the pandemic was to have the kids in the buildings. And if masks is a way to do that, then I fully support it in all of the buildings. I don't want to go back online. I want my students in the classroom. They were so happy today, so excited to be there. And I really don't want to move backwards. And I don't think anyone else does. I didn't hear a single kid complain about wearing the masks. And I know that's just my experience in the day, but you know, we always say how Avondale is a community, and I really think at a time like this, we can come together and make sure that the kids can stay in the classroom and learn the best way possible. Thanks. Thanks, Ms. Jarema. Alex Hartley. Hi, I uh, I am also a teacher up at the high school, um, and I just wanted to echo 
um, Emily's sentiments that the joy in the building today was palpable from students and in classrooms. Um, and if wearing a mask is what keeps these kids engaged and in the classroom, um, then you know that's what we need to do. 10 days of a quarantine um, is still too long to be out of the classroom, um, much less having to switch all the way back over to virtual. So um, whatever uh, measurements we need to take as a district to ensure that these kids get education inside of a classroom where it works best, um, then I think that we should fully support those measures. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Early. Uh, you're under Julie Brayman. <laughs> Um, yes, I'm sorry to tie up her Zoom one more time. My name is Justin Brayman. I'm Travis's father. He introduced himself a little bit earlier. Um, my uh, college education background was a focus in biology, specializing in parasites and parasite ecology. And my junior thesis was on Ebola transmission, which is a similar mode, but uh, Corona is actually much, much more infective than said uh, than, than Ebola. Uh, I have heard a lot of questions about the science. Um, I have no question with the science. It works. What I would like to speak to is if you won't accept the science, please. I, I, I'm a 20 year retired combat vet. I hear talk from people all the time that they'd be willing to take a bullet for their country. All you're being asked is if you are physically able, take a needle and put a cloth, piece of cloth across your face. The sooner everyone comes around and does that, the sooner our neighbors are protected, the sooner we break the cycle of transmission, the sooner it goes away and we go back to normal. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brayman, and thank you for your service as well. Okay, your list is iPhone 2. Please state your full name. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hi, this is, uh, my name is Norma Bell. And I'm just going to keep it short. I've heard both sides. Um, I just wanted to let you know that I am um, in favor of the mask mandate 100%. That's it. Thank you, Ms. Bell. You're welcome. Jason Wantuck. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, great. I'll try to keep my comments uncharacteristically short. Um, but thank you for everybody for having this meeting. Thank you for allowing so many people to speak. Um, everyone's obviously very passionate about things, and, and we all care about our kids, and you guys do too, and we all know that. Um, I'll just try to be quick. I mean, after a year and a half, I mean, let's be honest, Dolly, I mean, nobody's going to Nobody's probably going to say anything here tonight, whether they're a lay person or an expert, that's probably going to change someone's mind after a year and a half. I don't think anyone's going to be able to hear something and go, golly, I never thought of that and change their mind. Um, but I do appreciate everyone um, speaking their mind and, and sharing their stories. Um, with regard to personal choice, it's a big thing, a big theme here. Uh, you know, again, I think when someone's personal choice stops, it doesn't stop with their person and it affects other people, that's where we get into an issue. Um, if you don't want to mask your kid because you feel against it, the, I understand that. But you not masking your kid doesn't just affect your kid and your family, it affects others and their families. Um, the kid sitting next to him maybe has an elderly grandmother or something, you know, some type of high risk person. Um, and that's what we really need to think about is that we are a community and not just in the touchy feely kind of way, the happy way, but also we are a community and everybody kind of such as everybody else, and we have to think about that. Um, another common theme tonight is that, you know, that, that you know, if, if uh, people, people went to summer school, people have been hanging out all summer, and gosh, no one got sick, and, and I'm glad, I'm glad no one got sick, but that's not really evidence. I mean, that's, you know, if I put 10 people in a room, and I give you each a revolver, and I put a bullet in each one, and I give you a blindfold, and I say, hey, spin this thing, and aim it at your knee, and pull the trigger, there's a really good chance that everyone's going to come out with no marks at all, but it's still a really stupid idea, and so I don't think we need to be taking unnecessary risks. Um, for personal freedom, you know, if you don't want to wear a seatbelt because you think those laws are dumb, okay, 
don't wear a seatbelt, go out and drive. And if you get in an accident, the thing is, if you ram me with your car, I'm not going to get hurt because I have my seatbelt on. If you don't, and you're probably going to get hurt. And I guess that's your personal choice. I'm not advocating anyone do that, mind you, but I suppose that's your personal choice. Um, but it doesn't affect me. And you not wearing a mask does possibly affect me or my children or other people. Um, and finally, I'll just say this. Uh, this comes down to a really simple t- choice. Either you think this is more serious or you don't. And the thing is, you know, I support masks. I think this is trending a bad way. I, I'm certainly in that camp that thinks this is more serious. And if I'm wrong, then I'll be glad to be. If I'm wrong, you'll be inconvenienced. It's a pain. You'll have a, a, a dirty, you know, mask. It's a pain in the butt. You'll be inconvenienced. But if I'm not wrong, and this is more serious, you know, the consequences of, of that are much more dire. And so I think that's really what it comes down to is, are we willing to take that risk or not? The doctors could be wrong. The models could be wrong. I hope to God they are. That, that would be great. But it's just, how do we take risks? As parents, we always try to protect our kids. And sometimes we can, sometimes we can't. No one wraps everybody up in a bubble wrap and sends them out. But we do say, hey, don't go play in the street. And we do say, hey, don't go to a stranger's house. So I just don't think that this small act that can have such a big impact, according to all the people that are much Thank smarter you. than me. Um, it's too much to ask. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you, Mr. Wontuck. I don't see any other hands pending currently. Uh, one last call before we close public comment. Oops, there's one, Julie. iPhone, please state your full name. Uh, this is Catherine Hawkins. Thank you. I'm um, kind of a last minute here. I'm, I'm very good at listening and just kind of seeing what's going on, where, where people's minds are at. Um, first of all, thank you so much to, to the board for having this little meeting here. I know it was very last minute, um, but I appreciate uh, the time and effort that you've all put in. I am very grateful for your mask mandate. Um, I'm hoping that this becomes a thing, especially as I'm listening to people say that all the germs that are found on kids' masks and boogers that are in their masks. Like I'm grateful that they're in your masks and not on the desks and on my kids. So I'm grateful that those boogers are in your mask. Um, also, like I, I know parents are saying, you know, I can decide for my child what's right, but I was so disheartened all COVID season when I had people telling me, oh, I tested positive for COVID. And then I literally saw them with my own eyes at the grocery store. Or people told me, yes, I've been notified. I'm a close contact or I've been in contact, but I'm not quarantining. I literally watched people send their children to school that I knew were close contacts. So I'm sorry, but I don't trust anybody. And I, if, if putting a mask on your child, you know, is, is going gonna, is gonna to make that easier for everybody and keep them in the seat, then, then I'm all for putting the mask on the kid. I'm also going to say, you know, my children were two children that were not able to attend school today. And the reason they did not attend school today is because they have tested positive for COVID. They got it from my husband, started with him. He is vaccinated. He had no idea. He had sneezing for 24 hours and that was it. We thought he had allergies. A couple of days later, my kids had some headaches. We thought, oh, they've just been out in the sun. A couple of days later, I'm sneezing. Well, sneezing lasted a couple days and I thought you know it's just my allergies too no big deal but you know what I thought my kids are going to school Monday let me be sure no cough no sore throat no fevers none of that at my house if I had not gotten tested my kids would have gone to school today and they all test they, my whole family tested positive how many children right now that went to their first day of school would now have to quarantine because my kids my family didn't know we had COVID I was shocked that I tested positive. Absolutely shocked for just a little bit of sneezing. But you know what? I got tested to make sure that my kids did not bring anything to anybody. We didn't affect anybody. My fear is passing it along to somebody else. Thank God I got tested. None of your kids are in quarantine right now that are in my kids' classes. But that's two full classes right there. On the very first day of school, because I went and got tested, they're not at school and your children are not in quarantine. So there you go. Me, there's two other friends I know of just this week that have tested positive that are vaccinated. 
that didn't it barely had any symptoms. It's out here. It's in the community. A lot more people have it than we think because we're getting these mild symptoms. Thank God we've been vaccinated and we're not getting sick and in the hospitals. But that that's a, a story right there for you. I mean, I'm, I'm if I'm the last one to speak, then I hope that the impression I'm leaving is that my getting tested just just to make sure kept people's kids from having to be in quarantine right now. Thank you, Mrs. Hawkins. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Mr. Lang, if I can. Thank you. Yes, yeah. of course. I'm um, a healthcare provider. I yeah. never ever want to put anybody at risk. Ms. Monroe. I'm pediatric critical care. I'd I've like to chest compressions. I breathe thank, for kids. Thank you for your sick. Thank, thank you, you for Ms. your Hawkins. input. I'd like Ms. Hawkins, I'd like to give you some resources. Um, so if you can connect with me tomorrow, I'll give you a call. Um, our school nurse is a great point of contact for any po positive COVID cases and education to support the transition back into school. So I'll give you a call sometime tomorrow afternoon. Thank you. I've actually been in touch with everybody, many, many people, including the health department, myself, and my kids are out of quarantine starting great. tomorrow. We're great. All Thank done you. And passed it. Yep. Great. Hey guys, is it too late for one more? Okay. Hey. Uh, Mr. Anderson, we'll put you in line right after Miss Gotchi. I, Thank you. I know. Yep, just a moment, please. Good evening. Uh, this is Gertrude Spath. Actually, it's my main name on there showing. Thank you for, for the time. Um, I first, I would like to thank the board for the meeting and then especially to Dr. Schwartz for the very informative presentation. My family fully supports universal masking and, and all COVID, COVID prevention and mitigation practices. Um, as recommended by the CDC and, and all scientific data. We trust the science. We're among the 160 plus billion of people in the US that have been fully vaccinated. and We cannot wait to add our children to that population. Uh, my husband and I have two children, a five and a half year old and a three and a half year old. The five and a half year old just started kindergarten today at Deerfield and, and she's super excited about it. Um, Prior to that, both our, our daughters were at uh, daycare in Troy, and they've been wearing masks universally, teachers and students, to and up, um, following all scientific and CDC recommendations um, since they started back in July in 2020. Um, the kids are resilient. They wear masks without any problem. They love their masks uh, with different, you know, superheroes, and um, they're, they're excited to be with their friends. So if they have to wear a mask, it's, it's not a problem for them. It's more of a problem for the adults. And they wear them better than a lot of the adults. Um, all I wanted to say that is right now, we don't have any other way to protect our children since the vaccines are not approved yet for them. And if a mask provides even, even a 10% protection, uh, I, we would like to provide that to our children. Um, as a parent, and, and all of you here are parents, most of you are parents, there's nothing worse than when your child is sick. Uh, the anxiety I feel when my children are sick cannot compare it to anything else. Please give the parents just a little bit more peace of mind. Please vote for a mask mandate while our transmission rates are at this level. Thank you and appreciate the time. Thank you, Ms. Beth. I think you said it was. Uh, Mr. Anderson, you're on. All right. Thank you. Hey, um, I've been listening for a while and I came in kind of <clears throat> excuse me late I actually missed the presentation I was at uh, hospital with my niece uh, but here's what I wanted to say um, I'm, I'm listening to the parents and I'm, I'm hearing the majority of the parents they're thinking about uh, just their child we're all in this together this isn't just about your child uh, or that child. It's all of the children. Um, I'm going to make a big leap here, and I hope it's not too much. I don't think any of us want to wear a mask. I hate wearing a mask. Uh, but if it's going to prevent uh, a child uh, or a parent of a child uh, from being put in the ICU, and then you hear about all these issues that the children have even after they recover, what's the price? I mean, we're all in this together and we're all going to have to get out of this together. And until those parents that selfishly call in and say, 
it's my child, it's my choice. No, it's our children and it's our choice. We have to do this together or we can't get it done. Because as so many other parents have mentioned, if your child comes to school and you don't know that that child's infected and it infects someone else, then it infects someone else and it carries. Please, parents, please stop just thinking about your situation and think about our situation because this isn't an individual case. If in this case, if your house burns down, my house is burning right there with you. So please mask your kids, mask yourself and think about others. I'm not just wearing a mask for me. I ain't wearing a mask. I'm wearing a mask for you. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. We certainly wish the best for your niece and a quick recovery. Thanks, guys. Have a good evening. Thank you. And please wear a mask. Thank you. Gerald Carnes. You know, I was I have three granddaughters in your school district and I'm listening to these comments and I'm it infuriates me. I'm so angry that I can't even talk. You guys, you're talking about science based data that masks protect children from getting COVID. There's no science. There's no science based data out there that they've not even done studies to prove that children are protected by wearing cloth or paper masks. There's no studies. So I don't know where the, where the science that you guys are finding, but it's, there's, no, there's not even been one single study. And in fact, more children get infected every year from the flu and die from the flu. 477 kids died last year from the flu, not from COVID. So I can't even talk to you guys because you're so closed-minded. The fact of the matter is, is if the teachers are vaccinated and the staff is vaccinated and the grandparents and the parents and whoever wants to be vaccinated, or let's talk about antibodies for a second. There's a whole lot of people that have had COVID and survived that have a better, a better internal support system that God gave them. That's way better than a man-made vaccine. There's a whole lot, a lot of people out there that have that. And a lot of them aren't even counted because like the woman said earlier, she didn't even know she had COVID until she got tested. There's a whole demographic of people all summer long that thought they had allergies that had COVID and survived. So that's a whole bunch of other people that have natural antibodies. And let's talk about how come we're not talking about the fact that masking children impedes their ability to learn. Children need to see their teachers' mouths moving. They need to see facial expressions, emotions, other kids' lips moving when they talk to them. I mean, did you not hear about all the suicide rates last year of all these kids that were depressed, stuck at home, couldn't socialize, couldn't do anything? I cannot believe that you guys, as adults, don't even take into account all that data. And you're just so narrow-minded that you just think that putting a cloth mask over a child's face is going to protect everyone. You guys are never going to outrun COVID. I guarantee you. So you're never going to outrun it. You will always be on your tail. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Ms. Carnes. Um, Ms. Rich, I see that you're back on our list here. However, we do only allow people to speak once per night, but I can't see if there's another family member there that would like to speak. But if it is you, I respect that you write to the board instead of speaking twice. Thank you. Ms. Bondi. I'd just like to say I have two children in the district and if they do require masks, we will re remove my children. That is all. Thank you, Ms. Bondi. Amber Carter. Hi, I'm actually at work right now, so I can't really talk long, um, but I just wanted to answer the previous person um, who spoke earlier about there not being any science-based studies. 
Um, and November, on November 16th, 2020, um, the CDC released um, a study uh, that was had um, over 139 participants in it um, in high-risk exposure events. Um, and masking uh, with cloth masks was found to present a 70% reduced risk in transmission among people who were infected with COVID to people who did not uh, have an infection. And uh, zero of the 67 clients who were reached for the post interviews showed no, uh, uh, zero of those clients showed any um, any uh, exposure or any um, positivity to COVID afterwards. So there have been several studies um, since November 2020 that have proven positively that masks do in fact work, especially among high risk exposure events. I just wanted to say that. Thank you, Ms. Carter. Um... I don't see any other. I'm sorry, Ms. Carnes. We do only allow people to speak once per evening, so thank you. Um, I don't see any other new hands up. Or is there anyone else that would like to speak to the board this evening before I close public comment? I would. I would There's, like to just add one quick comment. This is, uh, I'm sorry, I don't. Julie, do you have that one? Andrew? <laughs> yeah. Uh, this okay. is my husband's computer. My name is actually Melody Heishen. Um, We have two kids who just started today for the first time at Auburn Elementary. My son's in kindergarten and my other younger son is in the ELC. Um, and I just want to throw my hat into the ring for supporting a universal masking mandate um, for kids who cannot get vaccinated. Um, it is literally the only thing that we can do to protect them. Um, I want to thank a lot of these other people who are coming to the board with um, evidence. I don't have a lot of um, documents right now, but I want to thank Maureen Sharp, Trinise Layton, Dan Meet Singh, Amber Carter for speaking up on the part of medical evidence, um, and Julie Brayman for sharing your story. So many people who have spoken up. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We strongly support universal masking um, and thank you to the board for taking this under consideration today. That's all. Thank you, Ms. Heishen. And I believe we have uh, Ms. O'Connor Schwartz. Hello, um, I wanna start out by saying our family fully supports this mask mandate. Um, thank you to the board. <laughs> I don't envy your decision at all. Um, as Ms. Brooks stated earlier about this debate, we've already argued this. However, I see a trend with parents that, are, that were apoplectic last year about getting their kids back to in-person learning. Those are the same parents that are fighting for their kids to not have to wear masks this year. How selfish do you have to be? What happened to common decency? What happened to being a good example for our children? Our children are watching. And those of you who are saying you don't want to have this mask mandate, do better. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I don't see any other hands pending. We'll give one last call before we uh, close public comment. All right. And we're going to go ahead and close public comment for this evening. I do very much thank everyone for taking time this evening for addressing the board and for those that reached out to us in advance. Um, as I said, the board very much endeavors to respond to your communications and we were doing so well with doing that until we announced this meeting. And uh, at that time, our email boxes started to fill very fast. I do believe on behalf of the board, I do want to um, I, I believe we owe it to the public here to understand how we got to this meeting tonight too, because I think there's been some question about that. Over the last couple of weeks, we've watched our numbers increase coming back to school. And Dr. Schwartz and I both have a direct line to the Oakland County Health Department. We both have several lines there, as a matter of fact. And quite frankly, we have been begging um, the Oakland County Health Department for definitive guidance um, on masking in schools, as well as what are those trigger points that we need to, if we don't do it today, when do we do it? Um, unfortunately, as we saw these uh, case counts start to climb, uh, and then the Oakland County information and their recommendations, as I will put it in air quotes, uh, came out. Um, they were 
uh, not indicative of the guidance that we we're looking for, despite the count uh, starting to sneak up. So we very much would have endeavored to have this meeting and this decision before school started. However, um, as board protocol takes it, um, we publish our meetings three days in advance. And this was the first opportunity that we had to bring a meeting together after we got the Oakland County guidance. So I did believe I owed it to our public to understand why we put you through this um, one day after school started. So with our apologies, this was our absolute earliest opportunity to do that. So, um, and with that, Dr. Schwartz, we will move on to our action items. All righty. So moving on to 4.0, our action items uh, under non-consent, we have the uh, consideration of our COVID mitigations and mask protocols for uh, certainly the beginning of the fall of 2021. I recommend that the Board of Education approve the requiring of masks for grades TK through eight, or actually say pre-K through eight, and strongly recommend masks for grades nine through 12, unless we are in a substantial or high risk category in the county uh, until the end of the first trimester, which is November 23rd, 2021, at which time we will reevaluate the environment and thus the decision. I'll move. I'll support. Moved by Ms. Brault, supported by Mr. Johnson. Okay, at this point, we'll open it up for questions and comments. Who'd like to get us started? I'd like to, what are we going to do if we put this in place and we don't have a school? Miss, will you pull your, pull your microphone right up next to your mouth there? What are we going Thank to you. do? Is that better? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Uh, should we approve this and we don't have the support of the parents? How do we deal with that? In terms of folks not... Well, we fall back to just like we did last spring. I mean, we're going to be no different than we were last spring. So if, if there is, we have the right of placement as a school district. And so if we have repeated uh, incidences of, of not uh, wearing a mask um, and upon family conversations and so on, we have the right to move that, that child to virtual education. We would hope it doesn't get to that point, but that is certainly our right. Dr. Schurz, I, I had a lot of, heard a lot of conversations and, uh, and I was, one of the things that's been weighing on me a little bit heavier too um, is the testing, the, the actual coming in the door, doing the testing, the temperature checks. If you oh, will. daily screening. You're daily screening. Yes. That's the word I was looking for, the daily screening. Mm -hmm. um, is there... What would that look like from a support standpoint? I think even with the data that you provided, the daily screening adds that additional layer. As we, I think one of the one of the community members talked about the Swiss cheese approach, if you will, mm -hmm. and that's a that's another layer to provide some support for us trying to trying to nip this in the bud, if you will, from us Brett in the schools. Mm -hmm. What's it is, but uh, again, following back on on the uh, the recommendations were that if you are going with universal. Uh, masking that that was not that was less of a concern if you were not going with universal masking then they highly recommended that you follow through with that daily screening um, I mean it's the board's purview in which if you want to recommend the daily screening to put with that that's that's your purview it's not my recommendation at this point in time uh, again might there be a time that that's called for certainly uh, but I don't know at this juncture that that's something that we would if we're going to do universal screening that we would need to also do as well or universal masking i should say and i'm assuming dr schwarz that that this is an basically an amendment to our existing coded covid mitigation uh that everything else is implied to stay in place correct that is correct okay sir other questions or comments from the board? Um, I just have a comment, yep. uh, regardless of how this vote goes. I think just from some feedback that I've gotten outside of which way this is going to go, if we can clearly get to the families what the quarantine policy is going to be. Mm -hmm. I think that would be really helpful for uh, quite a few families. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
All right, so I'll go next. Okay. So my daughter's in elementary school at Deerfield. Um, you know, she is wearing a mask. She is unvaccinated. Um, and, you know, I, I said from the get-go, even when it was strongly recommended that she was going to be wearing a mask regardless, I didn't give her a choice in that matter. My son, he is a seventh grader. He is 12 at the middle school, and uh, he is vaccinated. And I told him to put on a mask this morning and, and go ahead and wear it just to be on the safe side. You know, I, I am torn because I do believe in personal choice. And at, at what point does that become our duty to dictate whether your child, especially if they're vaccinated, um, should have to wear a mask. Um, however, in my other life, I do work in healthcare and I do work for Henry Ford Health System. We are one of the first health systems to, to mandate that all staff get vaccinated. Uh, we made national headlines for that. Um, and speaking with the doctors that I speak with on a daily basis, and I oversee marketing for um, our Medicaid population, and uh, we're, we're trying to fight to get uh, those particular folks vaccinated. And um, I, at, at this point for our unvaccinated folks, while we can sit here and, and talk over the data, whether our mask is effective or whether it's not, or whether you're gonna have boogers in it, whether you're not, you know, at the end of the day, I think it does provide some additional level. Now, whether that be 2%, 10%, 20%, you could probably look at different data all the way around. I, I think at this point, I think a mask is something that's that's least needed for the short, short term until we can figure out what's going on with this Delta variant. Um, it's it, it can be scary. And I don't think we want to see any of our kids um, you know, get sick with this and have something happen, uh, you know, to one of our family members here in Avondale. Um, so, you know, for the time being, and again, I, have been torn about this. Thank you for all the, for all the, uh, the comments, the emails, the phone calls that I've received on this. And it's been something that's been weighing on me. I've even had fights with my own extended family members who have very opinionated on, on this particular issue as well, too. Um, but I, I just kind of wanted to put that out there for folks that that's, that's where I'm at. I, I think for the next couple of months, if we can grind through wearing this mask, um, you know, hopefully we can get through this and, uh, you know, we can get back to project-based learning. I, I want to talk about project-based learning <laughs> <laughs> and other fun stuff. And I want to see kids back in here making presentations and, and everything else. So um, that's all I have to say on that. I'd like to weigh in on that as well. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a tough decision. You're always torn. You have the, the data from both sides. Do masks work? Do they don't work? You know, it's all uh, an endless argument. And, and the whole uh, uh, mandating the mask and, and, uh, versus uh, parental choice. And you really hate to, you know, it's, it's, not, our, it's not our place to, to, you know, dictate what goes on within the community. And, and taking that right away from the parents, it's, it's you know, it's, it's difficult to, to do. I hate to look at it that way because I'd like to keep it all, you know, as strongly recommended. Um, but on the other hand, uh, we are a community and, uh, and uh, we got to stick together and make the right choice. And, and if you look at, you know, whether a mask is going to help or not, we got to do something to keep us, keep the kids back in chair and, and seat. And that's the most important thing is that the kids stay in school and not have to go to remote because, because we neglected to, to make the right decision and, and have it a free for all and have everybody make their own decisions. And maybe it's the wrong decision to not wear masks. And then now we we're sending everybody home. We're going remote. I think it's uh, I don't think that's the right road to go. Um, so with, with that being said, I, uh, I think we just have to make the right choice, you know, keep our personal opinions to ourselves and, and do what's right for the community. And that's why we're all here as a board. We have to do what's right for the community. And uh, that's all I have to say right now. Yeah. Mr. Donna, just, I guess, to follow on with your comments, you know, last time when we had this discussion, you know, I shared that I'm, I'm a bit torn. Um, I think the responsible thing to do for every American, that those that can get vaccinated should get vaccinated. I, I believe in the science enough there. Um, and that's my personal opinion, not my board opinion. Um, my board opinion is that I believe that we all took an oath um, 
to provide a safe and secure. Um, and it's also one of our, our guiding principles that we're providing a safe and secure environment for our children. Um, and as I look across um, whether they have the right to make mandates or not um, is a subject of debate. But as I look across the different health organizations um, throughout the United States and locally here, and can't come up with one credible health source that says that universal masking is not recommended for element, you know, or for for children in schools. Um, I'm very hard pressed to go against that, despite the fact that I agree with you, Mr. Down. I think that, um, and and Mr. Tisher, that that you know, parents have a a voice in what happens to their children at schools and. I, I would encourage those parents to please have that conversation with your pediatricians. I think it's a very short conversation to have and that we have a method in place that will allow you to um, have that conversation with your pediatrician and make the right decision for your children. Um, and, and that's, uh, we, we have that in place here. So, um, so yeah. Yep, agree, Mr. Lang. And the only thing that I keep, I think I'm, it's just stuck in my head right now, these daily screenings. <laughs> I can't help it. I can't help it. And and what kind of speaks to me more so is, again, even after Mr. Lang, you mentioned the, the safety of the students, and that's what we're here for outside of providing an educational environment. Uh, even if we were able to tie it to the substantial or high risk, if our goal is to limit the or contain or however you want to identify that, and, and we add that to the substantial and high risk to add those daily screenings to provide us that extra step because we know things are blowing up, if you will, I would feel more comfortable as a board member that we're providing the, the, the system with a little bit more security outside of just a, a, a recommendation or a, a mask mandate. We're given that extra layer of security so that I would feel more comfortable having my son knowing that to the point of a couple of school, uh, community members that spoke, not knowing what COVID looks like now, right? Where the symptoms are different. And that gives us an extra outside of a mask being able to say, okay, we at least have that extra step of precaution as the only thing. So I, I would support um, adding the, the daily checks to if we're in a substantial or high risk, similar to what we're doing with the mask at the high school. Were we, um, forgive me, cause it's been ages ago in school board years. Um, were we doing daily temperature checks or just a clear to go? So we did clear to go. We did not do daily temperature checks. So we did clear to go, which was uh, an at home, call it on your honor checking system. Mm -hmm. So every morning you had to answer a subset of questions dealing with symptoms uh, related to COVID, one of them being your temperature. So Mr. Johnson, are you suggesting that we go over and above that? I think at a minimum, we go back to where we were with the clear to go. I mean, we can debate if we want to do something additional in those situations where we're higher, where we're, we're substantial or high risk, but I think we at least go back to where we were. Mm -hmm. So my question and follow up to that was, what was the completion rate of that? So of the people who were in seat, how many people actually completed that? What percentage was it? Everybody did, half of the people did. Um, I believe most, if not all, did it very regularly. Okay. Now, I will preface that with, there's a degree of honesty that not necessarily everybody had equivalent. So we had people that checked their daily screener as passing and sent their kid to school sick. So it's not foolproof. So again, it's up to the character of the individual parent in filling out that that uh, survey in the morning on how truthful it is, That's, and, and for the most part it was, but there were there were some occasions where that was not the case. And last year we had what like forty percent of the kids in school, as opposed to all of them. It depended on this on the on the level of the school building. Right, so right. at the high school we had lower numbers because yeah. they were more successful, you know, at that level with virtual. So it was about thirty five percent there, but we had places like Woodland that were close to 70%. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Mr. Lee, I saw you with your hand up there. I'm sorry, but we have closed public comment for tonight. So I'm very sorry. 
wanted a teacher standpoint from the clear to go, if that was possible. Uh, briefly, yes. Go ahead, Mr. Lee. Uh, so yeah, so there was quite a few completion and like Dr. Schwartz said, it was um, based on honor system, but it, as an educator it was hard. Um, I usually had at least, I'm not against the clear to go, but if this is something we bring back, I will say it was, uh, it interfered with my daily instruction because usually there's a, at least a good handful of people, families that didn't complete it. And so I'd always have uh, our medical para come around to every classroom to do it. So that was a struggle and it's usually the same families. So if this is the route we go, as an educator, I would like it to be less disruptive. Okay, thank you, Mr. Lee, appreciate that. Good. No, great feedback, Mr. Lee, thank you for that. What is the cost implement clear to go again? Oh, um, gosh, I don't remember. Ms. Monroe, do you remember what the cost was? I want to say it was... It was $17,000 for six months. Okay, thank you, Dan. 17000 for six months. Mm -hmm. So, Mr. Johnson, I guess I'll ask the question. Are you going to make a motion to amend the current or are you satisfied with just discussion at this point? I'll actually make the motion to add clear to go to the, uh, the substantial or high risk category. Do I have a second to Mr. Johnson's motion? I'll ask one final time, do I have a second? I'll second it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and then we'll have debate on that motion. Great. Yeah, and, and again, I, I kind of mentioned it before, just to provide us an extra layer. I, I know we asked about what the costs were. Um, from, from, from my standpoint, I'm thinking beyond cost. I'm thinking about the health of our, our, our community, right? So mm -hmm. the 17 grand, we can find it within the budget. I'm not overly concerned about that. It's, again, providing not just our teachers, our, our students, and our community members that extra layer of support. It does concern me that Mr. Lee said it did bother his classroom, though. Um, yeah. from the standpoint of him having to call in the, the nurse or the support to have those tests done at that point. I don't know how we remedy that, but I, I, I can recognize that as a, as a legitimate problem. And I, and I don't want to take away from that learning experience. But if the kids aren't healthy, I don't want them in the classrooms. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how else to do it. So again, just more for a conversation and debate to, to see what, what other thoughts are out there from a board standpoint. Yeah, no, I appreciate making the motion and, and bringing the debate forward. It, uh, uh, my two cents, uh, uh, everybody fills out a survey, check the box, you know what I yep. mean? Uh, scroll, scroll to the bottom, you know, last time you got an app, scroll to the bottom, check the box. Um, I, I, not that I don't think that there is some value in that. I question as to whether um, it's something additional that we want to put our educators and our parents through given the that that mask isn't our only protocol today we do have a dozen other layers of the swiss cheese yeah. already in place so i'm I sorry was, oh, it does do that but i just i just question the uh, the effectiveness of it and yeah. and you know it's like you here. say you check the box every day send your kid off to school it's just a routine thing is it really going to have an effect yeah i'm sorry Mrs. Monroe, did you want to weigh in here? I just have some things for consideration. So I'm going to separate. Um, I'm going to try to be as factual as I can with you. Uh, in monitoring statistics of completion of clear to go, well, I would say probably more than 80% of the people participated when we had 40-ish percent of the students in seat. Um, it did not appear from my point of view to leverage a lot of return on investment. Uh, my, other, my other just consideration point for the board is that while clear to go implementation is $17,000, and I agree with Mr. Johnson, when we, have, when we prioritize needs, we build a budget and tell our money where to go. There's additional funding required because each building would require an additional staff member to go build classroom to classroom every morning uh, because I, I will be very transparent, and I think we all know this, 
but every single member of our teams already have defined responsibilities. Our administrators are in the halls, they're connecting with students, they're saying good morning, they're getting things started for a routine day. Our secretaries are doing attendance, they're all the daily startup. In order for to implement Clear to Go with the fidelity or the spirit of the conversation, I believe you would need to add the cost of an additional support team member for every building plus the seventeen thousand dollars. Yep. Thank you, Ms. Monroe. Mr. Yeah. Tish, you have something to add to that or yeah, I, I, I think I wanted to echo Mr. Lang and, and Mr. Downs' comments. I I, I think um you know, without signing, I think it's a feel good thing. <laughs> and, and and I think, you know, and Mr. Johnson, thank you for bringing it forward. But I, I just think people go down and click, no, 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 get that green arrow and boom, we're good to go for the day and off we go. Plus, um, you know, with this variant, you may be asymptomatic, your kid may feel fine. So I, again, that's, I just don't think it's worth the additional cost there, personally. And I guess I just would hope that people wouldn't send their kids sick to school in the first place ever, um, but it's going to happen. So, I mean, whether you fill out a survey or not. So, exactly. um, yeah, yep. unfortunately. I, I think the intention was great, but I think it's amazing that this conversation could be had so that the community can see we really are taking this seriously. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the, the piece of the clear to go, the boxes that have to be checked, I know for a fact that there were students who should have checked yes instead of no that morning last year when the buildings reopened and they were severely sick and sent to school. And so I think this speaks to how we need the community to, to step in and assist us with this at all. If your children are not feeling well, they should stay home. Yep. As a former educator, I know for a fact that uh, parents do send their kids to school sick. Um, before we shut down in March of 2020, I had a young man there in my classroom. He couldn't hold his head up. He was so sick. And he says, my mom made me come to school. She said, I can't stay home. So I know kids are sent to school. I mean, and to be honest, when I, my kids were young, I gave him some Tylenol and sent him to school because <laughs> I had to go to work. I mean, so that's just the way it is. So. Yeah. And I would just, and if my if I was in that situation, I check yes. Yep. Give him some Tylenol and say, try to speak that, try to feel better today. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, him to I mean, yep. so just being honest. <laughs> yep. I'm okay with calling a question. Okay. All right, uh, on the motion, uh, voting on the motion to uh, add the clear to go to uh, to our COVID protocols. Uh, Mr. Johnson. Yes. Ms. Davis. Yes. Ms. Washington. No. Mr. Tischer. No. Mr. Down. No. Ms. Brault. No. Mr. Langs, so no. I'm sorry, but the motion does not carry. So we'll return to our original discussion and motion. Uh, is there any additional discussion on that before we call the question on the original motion? All right, hearing none, uh, we'll vote on our original motion. Uh, Ms. Brault, I believe that was you that moved it. Mr. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Tischer. Yes. Mr. Down. Yes. Ms. Davis? Yes. Ms. Washington? Yes. Mr. Lang is an aye. Motion carries. Thank you all for your participation this evening. Mm -hmm. And with that, uh, I believe we are moving on to board comments. Oh, goodness. Uh, I started to my right last time. We'll start down to my left this time, Mr. Down. Uh, I think I had just about all I had to say, but uh, I'll kind of reiterate. Um, I uh, it was a tough decision. Uh, we all have our our facts and our opinions, and and we have to kind of lay all that aside to do what's right for the community. And uh, even looking at, uh, I don't know enough about this Delta variant and, and how fast it's spreading, and and how it seems to be very stealth like. 
and uh, I, I hate to see. I just want to do whatever it takes to hopefully eliminate uh, going remote. I don't know if it's going to happen, but I think if we can at least slow it down and get the kids in, in the class for at least a semester, that'd be nice. Uh, two trimesters would be great. Um, the whole year would be fantastic. But, uh, you know, we just got to do everything we can. And you know, if it's wearing masks to, to help, you know, snub that, the, the spread and slow things down enough to where we can stay in seat and the kids can stay in seat, uh, I think that we're doing doing something positive for the community and, and, and the district. So uh, with that being said, uh, stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Ms. Brault. I wanted to thank everybody who uh, came to participate in this meeting. Uh, I particularly want to recognize the students who spoke up. Uh, it takes a lot to get out there and do that. So thank you very much to both of you guys. Um, I also just wanted to say that I got the opportunity to tour the schools today, masked uh, to, you know, all around the district to see everything in action for this first day of school. And it was just such a positive joy to see all of the students in the buildings with in the classrooms with their teachers and uh you know all the children most of the children had masks on and they were just so happy to be there and um you know much like i think my colleagues feel i just i want us to stay in the classrooms so so badly um my kids, they just need to not be in my house anymore. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I'm sure a lot of people feel that way. Um, and I know that this whole community, everybody has great, the best of intentions, and we're all looking out for our kids. And uh, I hope we can move forward with us and uh, just, you know, do the best that we can. And uh, I don't know, hopefully have a really, really amazing year where our kids just learn so much and make friendships and just do great things. So uh, thank you guys so much. Have a great year. And, uh, you know, we as a board, we're, we're doing our best to support the best of the community. So thank you so much. Thanks, Mr. Tischer. Yes, thank you, Ms. Lang. Um, I want to thank everyone who spoke tonight. Uh, I, uh, all the opinions on, on both sides of this matter, uh, whether you agree or disagree, thank you for uh, thank you for making those comments, saying those emails and those phone calls, and 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 talking with me personally. I I do appreciate um you know all sides of this issue. Um, so I think I'll kind of leave it at there. Um, it's that time that time of year again. Time to move on. So new season of blessings in the backpack Avondale will be starting. So if you have, uh, if you have a child that it's on free or reduced lunch, or, you know, a family that's on free and reduced lunch, a form will be, uh, sent out or has already been sent out and you can sign up for blessings in the backpack Avondale. And that provides meals, um, to kids on the weekend. So, uh, we are currently, um, it's kind of open enrollment, if you will, so to speak for that. So, uh, we are going to be packing every week and providing, uh, those particular meals on the weekends going forward for the remainder of the school year. So looking forward to uh, another seasons of blessings in the backpack Avondale. We do, um, we do take volunteers to come help us pack on a weekly basis. So if you're interested, please feel free to reach out to me and I'll happy to put you uh, in touch. Either I'll get you on the schedule or I'll put you in touch with uh, some other folks that are also on our steering committee as well, too. Uh, so that's all I have to say. Uh, stay safe and have a good night. Thank you, Mr. Tischer, and thank you for your continued advocacy of a very well-received program for our community. Thanks. Mrs. Washington. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for their comments tonight. Um, trust me, I listened to everything that you said, and I heard the emotion in your uh, voices. So I truly felt what you said. Um, I also... Uh, was with Ms. Brault today when we went visiting the schools and I love seeing the little ones uh, in the schools and they were so happy to be there, mask and all. So I thought that was a good thing. Uh, on a personal note, um, I know everyone's talking about the COVID and how it's not that serious and what have you. So Mother's Day, my sister-in-law was sick with COVID and she was in the hospital. The next, a week later, she was on a ventilator. A week later, we were planning her funeral. Um, my brother called us. Um, she was in Spectrum in Grand Rapids. And my brother sent us a uh, email so that we could spend the last moments with her. So we were, I was there 
virtually, but I was there and I could feel it when they removed her from life support. And I don't want anyone to have to go through that. It's bad enough with an adult, but with a child, I just can't imagine it. So um, I just want you, those of you who disagree with this decision to consider that. And I too, I hate this thing, I hate it, but I wear it because it protects people. It protects everyone and I wash it every night so it doesn't keep all that other crap in it. So, no, I don't get bigger because no I wash it every night. You know? And that's for precautions as well. And uh, to that, I'll say good night. Thanks, Mr. Johnson. Everything's been said and it's hard to follow Ms. Washington after that one. The only thing I say, I, I'm proud of Avondale. Uh, we've, we've created a, a community of, of having your voice being heard. And, and that's what we've done from, from parents to students uh, to teachers. And even from a board standpoint, I, I further appreciate you as a board because we can, we can have the hard discussions without it getting personal, without it getting ugly. And, and we know it's for the best of Avondale. And I appreciate you guys for that. But I do. I love Avondale. And uh, everybody stay safe. Thank you. Ms. Davis. It has been a long day. <laughs> Um, I was in the buildings today and to see the kids there, I instantly remember what last September looked like. And so if this is what we need to do to keep these babies butt in seat, then I am all for it. I'm, I'm all for it. On a personal note, uh, parents in those drop off lanes tomorrow, let's take it easy on each other. <laughs> take it easy. Stay safe, my friends. <laughs> Good night. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Davis. Um, I, I, again, I want to echo Mr. Johnson's comments. Uh, this board is phenomenal at, at, at drawing forward comments from each other. Um, thank you for taking the time to patiently listen to our public. Um, I think we owe that to every single one of them, and we would have sat here all night uh, if another 300 showed up and wanted to speak, because that's the kind of board we are. Uh, I, too, was in the schools this week. I have the honor as a board president of greeting the teachers and staff and giving them a welcome back. I want to thank the, uh, Dr. Schwartz for almost making me cry. Um, if you didn't hear the story, Ms. <laughs> Ms. Washington was there with me. Uh, Dr. Schwartz showed a, a uh, short movie that uh, discussed a student who was fidgety in his chairs as a young child and kept getting sent to the office. And as he grew up, he'd get sent to the office more frequently at a fidgety. And finally, there was a teacher that reached out to him. And I forget what this teacher's name was. It's really not consequential. But uh, this teacher finally turned around and said, you know, Johnny, you need to stay after class. And Johnny thought the gig is up. He had had it. And what it was is uh, he actually handed Johnny his first set of drumsticks and said, Johnny, I think you're a drummer. Fast forward to this person who's now a professional drummer has played all over the world with a number of different bands and things of that nature. Um, so that's what I got to follow coming up. And, and if that wasn't emotional enough, I did take that opportunity. As most of you know, uh, my son has severe Tourette's and went through Avondale schools, went through Graham, went through middle school, went through the high school. And I took that opportunity to thank those teachers for being the Mr. Johnson and learning what Tourette's is and making sure that my student is successful. And I know they do that for literally thousands of students in our district and how important that was. So I did have an opportunity to thank all of our educators for, um, and not only the educators, the staff at every level of the building um, and making sure that our students are well taken care of like that. So, um, so yes, thank you for almost making me cry. I really appreciate that. <laughs> With that, everyone, um, again, Thank you sincerely from this board um, for your input, for your continued participation. Um, we will continue, as we promised last time, to watch this very closely. Um, and as situations dictate differently, we will meet again and we will have this discussion again. Thank you. We will call our meeting at 959.